Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to the State of Transportation Systems Forum hosted by the Polk Transportation Planning Organization, or the Polk TPO. I'm Parag Agarwal, and I'm the Executive Director of the Polk TPO. The Polk TPO serves as the Metropolitan Planning Organization, or the MPO, for the Polk County. And in our role as the MPO of the area, we serve the entire Polk County, including the 17 cities of Polk County. As we all know, Polk County is a community on the rise. We are strategically located between Tampa and Orlando, and we are one of the fastest growing communities in the country. We are strong, we are dynamic, and we are diverse. With significant growth also comes infrastructure challenges. So today, the State of Transportation Systems Forum will feature speakers, panel members from across Central Florida to discuss the various transportation trends, issues, and policies facing our residents in Polk County. So this is the program schedule for today's forum. I hope you all enjoyed the breakfast and the networking. The breakfast was sponsored by Stantec. Thanks to Laura Hersher for making that happen. Uh, after, my, or after my introductory comments, we have two keynote speakers. The first keynote speaker today is the executive director of Florida Turnpike Enterprise, Nicola Licori. And the second keynote speaker today we have is uh, Frank Domenko, who is the Florida practice leader of smarter mobility at Stantec. After our keynote speakers, we have a panel discussion. And in the panel discussion, we have keynote speakers from uh, Florida Department of Transportation, Mr. John Kubler, Mr. Bill Beasley, who's the county manager of Polk County, and Mr. Tom Phillips from Citrus Connections. And we have basically reserved the best thing for the last, so that you all stay till the end of this forum. Uh, at the end, you can also look at this great facility of Suntrax. Suntrax is basically the hub of transportation innovation and technology. And some of the technology that you will see today is the one that you will be seeing on our roadways in the next 20 to 30 years. But I would like to start this forum by giving you a brief overview about Polk County, our population, our employment numbers, and of course, our mobility trends. As of July of 2022, the population of Polk County was more than 785,000, which is up from 725,000 in 2020. So we increased at a rate of around 7.5% in the last two years making us the fastest growing county in Florida and the fifth fastest growing county in the country. We all know that Polk County is huge in area. We are more than 2,000 square miles and we are bigger than the states of Rhode Island and Delaware. We all have seen the press releases like Polk ranks among the nation's fastest growing metro areas or Polk County adds 24,000 new residents, making it to be the fastest growing county in Florida. Recently, the Forbes magazine published saying Polk is Florida's fastest growing county and the fifth fastest growing county in the country. Talking about population projections, we all have, wit we all have witnessed a significant population growth in the last 10 to 20 years. But how will the Polk County look like in the next 25 to 30 years? As per the population projections conducted by Polk TPO, the population of Polk County is expected to be around 1.2 million by 2050. And we will be growing at a rate of around 2% annually. 
if we spatially divide this growth into our three planning areas, the maximum amount of this growth will happen in the northeast part of the county, which includes the cities of Winter Haven, Davenport, and Haines City. The, the northeastern part of the county will be growing at a rate of around 50%, followed by the Lakeland area, that will be growing at a rate of around 40%, and the southern, southern part of the county is expected to remain much more agricultural or suburban in nature. Talking about employment projections, I'm very happy to say that because of the efforts of our economic development professionals, I saw Sean, Lindsay, Eric Levy in the room, uh, the Polk County is no longer a bedroom community of Tampa or Orlando. The number of jobs in Polk County are expected to grow by around 360,000 by 2050, up from 220,000 in 2020. Again, growing at a rate of around 20%, at a rate of around 2% each year. And if you basically divide this growth, especially in Polk County, just like the population, the maximum amount of job growth will happen in the Northeast, followed by the Lakeland area, and then the Southern parts of the county. Polk County's economy will continue to be one of the most diverse in the state, and the job growth will evenly distribute it across the industrial, commercial, and service sectors. Uh, talking about mobility trends, we are on a transportation forum, so we should talk about mobility trends. If you look at the data from the last 20 years, perhaps the only thing that's growing at a faster rate than our population is our traffic. Uh, in the last 20 years, the population grew by around 55%, whereas the traffic grew by more than 65%. The chart which you have over here, it basically shows, as of now, around 1.5% of county roadways are, are considered to be heavily congested. But in the next five years, around 9% of the county roadways will be considered to be heavily congested. So just imagine from 1.5% to 9% in just five years. Talking about regional trails. In Polk County, we are trying to create a multimodal transportation network. And we talk, when we talk about multimodal transportation network, we talk about trails, we talk about bicycle facilities, we talk about sidewalks. The map which you have over here, it basically shows the regional trail network in Polk County. It has three colors to it, existing, committed, and proposed. The existing solid green line are the existing regional trails in the county, and our goal is to connect the major cities and the major greenways and recreational areas in Polk County with this multi-use trail system. The orange lines are the trails where, where funding is in place, where the funding is programmed already, and you will be seeing the construction in the next four to five years. And the dotted green line is basically planned or proposed, which we all know what it means. Uh, there's no funding in place, but it's planned. If you look at the major urban roadways in Polk County, around 35% of Polk County roadways have a sidewalk. And around 46% of the major urban roadways in the county has a bicycle facility, which includes a bike lane or a wider shoulder. Talking about transit, very happy to say that under the leadership of Mr. Tom Phillips from Citrus Connections, the transit system in Polk County is progressing very well and is getting stronger every year. Uh, this is basically the map that shows the Citrus Connections boarding. And if you look at this table over here, 
before COVID in 2018 to 2019, there were around 1.2 million passenger trips annually in Polk County. And because of this COVID, it, the number of passenger trips, it was on a decline. And it was a national trend. It was all over Santa Florida, it was all over the country. Because of COVID, the number of passenger trips went down. But again, very happy to say, if you look at this number, in the first quarter of this year, we are projected to go back to the 1.2 million number. We are projected to go back to normal, our pre-COVID numbers in 2018 to 2019. Uh, talking about safety, uh, safety is one issue which we should focus on more, and it's something we should be worried and care about. Although we are very proud of our Polk County and our communities, but the fact is, in 2021, the Lakeland Winter Haven area was listed as the ninth most dangerous metro in the metro area in the country to be a pedestrian. If you look at the data from the last five years, there have been around 135 fatalities on Polk County roadways each year. And there have been more than 450 serious injuries on Polk County roadways each year. Out of 67 counties in Florida, Polk County ranks at number seventh in terms of fatality count, and we rank at number 14th in terms of serious injuries, something which we should care about. Again, as I always say, these are not just numbers. These are our families. These are our friends. So we have a lot more data, uh, but because of the interest in time, you have two handouts on your table. The first handout is basic, the state of transportation systems flyer. It has all the tables, it has all the graphs which I have displayed on my PowerPoint presentation. And then the Polk TPO staff has also put together a series of maps. That series of maps gives you a lot more information, a lot more data about our transportation system in Polk County. I hope you will take those map series and will use them in your policy making decisions. But before I give the mic to our first keynote speaker, we want to know more about our audience. Today, more than 120 people have registered for this uh, State of Transportation Forum. That means the people of Polk County really care about transportation issues. So we have designed a Mentimeter poll which has around four to five survey questions. And I will encourage you uh, two steps. Number one, cell phone connection is a bit weak in this building. I got my new cell phone over the last weekend, and I do not have connection over here. So I will encourage you to uh, set up your uh, cell phones through a, a Wi-Fi. If you go to your Wi-Fi, the free Wi-Fi is on ramp. I'm with you. Go to your Wi-Fi, and it's on-ramp. Once you go to on-ramp, you will have to put your email. There's no password, and you can log in. After you have done this, there's a QR code. There's a QR code over here. There's a QR code in your handout also. Uh, once, you are, once you have logged in, once you have scanned the QR code, we have put together uh, four questions just to know what you think about our transportation system. Uh, the first question is, what city or incorporated parts of the county did you commute from today? It's a word cloud, Lakeland, Auburndale, we are in Auburndale, right? I saw the city manager and the staff over here. Orlando, folks are here from Orlando. Okay. So we do have a good mix over here. We do have a good mix, Lakeland, Auburndale, Winter Haven, North Lakeland. Okay. 
The second question is, what do you consider the biggest transportation and or land use challenge facing Polk County? And the options are inadequate pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure. Second, congestion on major roadways. Third, lack of affordable housing. Fourth, environmental impacts. Insufficient public trans transit options. Population, population growth or development pressure. Congestion on major roadways is coming to be almost number one. Followed by population growth. So population growth and congestion are basically together, right? So, but it seems maximum number of people say congestion on major roadways is one of the biggest issues facing the Polk County residents, followed by population growth, followed by insufficient public transit options, lack of affordable housing. Some folks are saying environmental impacts on, of transportation thing, others. But again, as you can see, congestion and population growth are the two biggest issues which the stakeholders think over here is facing the Polk County residents. Thank you. Uh, moving on to our third question. Which factor is most important to consider when planning for our transportation in our community? The options are better access to destinations, traffic congestion, safety improvements. At our TPO board meeting, I heard the cost. At what cost? So the cost is one of those options. Cost how much? Safety improvements. But again, as you can see, uh, traffic congestion is on everyone's mind. Safety improvements. Safety improvements, traffic congestions are basically number one and number two key issues which the county residents think are the biggest challenges for Polk County. Better access to destinations. Thank you. So again, uh, we have our data. There's no good or bad answer. What is the most congested road in the county? Again, you can say this based on your personal experience. The road in I-4, we all know it's I-4, right? It's like I-4. I-4, US-27. It seems all of a sudden I-4 took the lead. I-4, US-27, US-98. And again, if you look at uh, these, if you look at our data also, I-4, US-27, US-98, they are the most congested roads in the county. But it's good to see even the perception is also, is also the same. These are the most congested roads in the county. Uh, moving on, again, okay. As I said, everyone is here, all the, state, all the major players are here. Name one road which you would like to be improved today. If you can go there, if you can, uh, Florida Department of Transportation here, everyone is here. If you want to tell them which road you need to improve. Again, I-4, right? Help us out with I-4. I-4. Someone is saying I-4, someone is saying Interstate 4. Same thing. 98, South Florida Avenue. Lakeland folks are saying South Florida Avenue. US 27, US 98, but again, it's I-4. Uh, moving on, I think we are in our last question. Uh, rank the following transportation improvements in order of importance to you in Polk County. The options are road maintenance to improve existing roads, road expansion to increase road capacity, more frequent and expanded public transit options. Uh, Tom Phillips is here, he's hearing this, so again, more frequent and added public transit options. Uh, 
road expansion. I saw Jay Jarvis, road expansion. Better infrastructure for walking, biking. Again, all the great, all great information that will help us to further improve our transportation systems and to draft suitable policies accordingly. Uh, so this was the end of our Mentimeter. Going back to my presentation, today we are joined by many elected officials, commissioners from city and county commissioners. Uh, if you can just wave your hand so that we can recognize you for your service. So with this, I will invite our first keynote speaker. She is the executive director from Florida Turnpike Enterprise. And it's my understanding that Florida Turnpike Enterprise also maintains the Suntrax facility. So again, she's also our host. Again, thank you, Nicola. Please join us. Good morning. Well, welcome. Thank you for having me at, um, at this event. And we are pleased to host this event as the owners and operators of the SunTrax facility. So, so welcome to you all. I really appreciate the opportunity, uh, one, to speak in front of you to, to share a little bit about our organization, some of the priorities that we have, um, but also to, to hear from you all. I'm looking forward to the, to the panel discussion. Um, I, I loved that exercise that we just did. That was probably the most effective project prioritization I've, I've ever seen, pretty efficient, right? Um, and I think the point is that, you know, we can, we can look at all kinds of data, right? Um, and, and we do, we're, we're very good at that. But we also, we also inherently know the, the needs that are in, um, in the various areas and the priorities that, um, that we have as it relates to transportation solutions and how we need to go about addressing some of those. But I, I love that exercise, that was, that was great. So what I'm gonna do this morning is um, really just give you a little bit of an overview of Florida's Turnpike Enterprise, who we are, how we fit into the broader transportation um, agency FDOT and then talk a little bit about um, our capital plan and what it looks like. I'm going to do a little bit of a, a comparison um, over the last 20 years and then um, and then talk specifically about the the Centrax facility where we are today. So the very first thing that I want to talk about again Florida's Turnpike Enterprise is part of the Florida Department of Transportation and and proudly so and what I first want to, to go through is really what we consider our, our compass as it relates to transportation and meeting the needs of the, the state of Florida. And the, the secretary has, has talked about this, Secretary Purdue has, has laid this out, um, but it, it is something that really resonates with each and every one of us as transportation professionals. And so these are really kind of the, the focus areas that we have. And so at the heart of it, as you can see, is communities, right? Everything that we do is about the people that we serve, whether it's our local community, whether it's our own neighborhood, whether it's the transportation community, uh, whether it's the, the community of the state of Florida or the tourists coming to visit us. There are a number of different communities and everything that we do at its core is serving a community. And so that has to be at the, the center of what we consider our, our compass here that, that leads us and guides us into uh, transportation, decision making, and, and solutions. Safety, we just uh, talked a little bit about safety. Safety is so incredibly important to all of us. When we take a look at our transportation network, whether it is in our own neighborhood or whether it's on, on the toll facilities or the interstate, safety is such a critical element. And how do we make our facilities safer, safer but how do we also educate our roadway uh, users um, into being uh, more safe as they're, they're utilizing the facilities? Um, resiliency. Uh, we, we know in the state of Florida we have a hurricane season that, um, that becomes a, a center of focus for us, 
for half the year. Um, but even when it's not hurricane season, we know there are any number of, of other events that, that can occur, like we had just a couple of weeks ago in South Florida. Making sure that our infrastructure is prepared for those things, making sure that it's resilient, involves making um, significant investments, but it also means being prepared to respond to, to those events when they occur. So, so being resilient both as, um, as responders, but also resiliency in terms of transportation investment. Making sure that we serve um, the, the commercial side of freight and logistics, making sure that we have a robust supply chain. I don't think in the, it, in before two years ago, there was ever uh, a more pervasive discussion about the importance of supply chain. We had an interruption to the supply chain and all of a sudden all of us became very well aware of just how important it is and just how, how much disruption can, um, can lead from, uh, from a break in the supply chain. So making sure that as transportation professionals, we keep that um, as a focus in our mindset as how we support the, the supply chain. Technology, as our roadways become more multimodal, as they become more um, technolo technologically efficient, we need to make sure that we're, again, incorporating that technology into the facility, making sure that it is user-friendly, uh, making sure that it provides information to, to the users and that it's reliable. So investments in technology are extraordinarily important. And then finally, workforce development. Uh, we know as transportation professionals that we need to continue to educate and recruit those that will come behind us. We, we need to make sure that we have an educated uh, group of professionals, whether they are uh, working on construction projects or they're designing the next uh, construction or the next roadway projects. We need to make sure that our investments in workforce development continue so we, we can continue to, to grow the transportation network in the years to come. So these things are, are focal points for the entire Florida Department of Transportation. Now a little bit specifically about Florida's Turnpike Enterprise. So what I wanted to do just is to, to give a little bit of context as to who we are as an organization. And so what you see here is a map of toll facilities across the state. And there are various color codes. And so those that are um, shaded in blue, kind of hard to see, so darker shaded, um, you have, of course, the Turnpike Main Line, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, but a number of, um, of roadways, like the Western Beltway 429, First Coast Expressway in the Jacksonville area, the Sawgrass Expressway down in Broward County, and of course Polk Parkway right, right here in Polk County. Those facilities were, uh, are built by the, the Turnpike system and those revenues go back into our trust fund and go into making investments into those roadways and expanding the roadways over time. So, so those, those, um, those facilities comprise the Turnpike system. But then we serve as the toll operator for the entire state of Florida. And so the other facilities that you see, the express lanes that you see in various parts of the, the state, uh, the Pinellas Bayway and Sunshine Skyway and Alligator Alley, I'm sure you all are familiar with, those facilities are FDOT toll facilities, but we serve as the, the toll operator for those facilities. So as Prague mentioned, we are the, um, the, the third largest state, have been for a number of years, but now we're the fastest growing state. Pretty significant when you think about how quickly we're growing. You know, we don't need statistics to tell us that. We feel it every single day, right? And, and so that's something that we have to, to continue to focus on. And so one of the things that I wanted to do, and then over the next couple of slides, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit of, of the Turnpike history along with, uh, with who we are today. So the Turnpike Enterprise um, was, was acknowledged as an enterprise back in 2002. So we've been an enterprise for about 20 years. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that our focus shifted um, just on operating toll facilities and really looking at investing in the infrastructure and expanding the infrastructure and doing it in a way that is um, efficient, much more efficient. And so one of our uh, key tenants at the Turnpike Enterprise is to have public sector motives, right? We are part of state government and proudly so, 
um, but private sector methods. How can we incorporate the best business practices into what we do as a toll operator to make sure our system is uh, one of the most efficient? And so, so we look at you know where we started 20 years ago and where we are today and how we've grown as an agency. And so I think it's pretty significant that it, back in, in 2003, 2002, 2003, our first fiscal years in enterprise, it, between then and today, the population has increased by 31%. Our customer base just inherently has grown. And the number of registered vehicles on the roadways has increased by 37%. When we look at vehicle miles traveled, back in 2003, we had 6.4 billion vehicle miles traveled on the turnpike system. And uh, just this past fiscal year, 11.5 billion, an 80% increase. That is a significant amount of roadway usage just on the turnpike system. And so, so looking at transportation solutions is extraordinarily important. Let's take a look at Polk Parkway. Polk Parkway opened in 1998. You can see this, this picture from the grand opening all those years ago. And in fiscal 2003, so it was still in its ramp up phase, about 17,000 transactions for that first year. In fiscal 22, over 41,000 transactions. The facility has grown very significantly, which is why we're making a number of investments to improve the, uh, the efficiency of that facility. Now let's talk about our tolling methods. Back in 2003, um, most of our tolls were collected by cash. You had to stop and, um, and pay the, the toll collector in the lane. And we had introduced SunPass in 1999, but it was still in its early stages. Our early adopters jumped on right away, but, but some folks didn't. And so still, two-thirds of our customers still chose to, to pay cash. Today, nearly all of our facilities collect tolls electronically, primarily through the SunPass system, but also through our toll-by-plate. And just this past year, we converted the Polk Parkway to all electronic tolling collection. That has a number of benefits. Is that it has a benefit from an operating efficiency as, um, as a toll back office, but it also has an efficiency for the roadway user. No longer do you have to stop, or, or you don't have to, even if you have a SunPass transponder, you don't have to wait for the person in front of you to stop. It also allows for more free flow, a safer roadway uh, usage, and it's better for the environment. It reduces emissions overall. So a lot of benefits over a, a number of, of um, in a number of, of different areas. We have converted most of our system um, to all electronic tolling. We have a few facilities left that still accept cash, and we will be phasing that out over the next five to 10 year period. So talking a little bit about SunPass, so can I ask how many people in here have a SunPass? Excellent. All right, that's great. Well, we are proud to say that we are the most interoperable um, transponder in the, the, uh, in the nation. And so interoperability, what, is, what does that mean? It really means portability. It means customer convenience. And so you can take, if you have a SunPass Pro, you can use it in 22 states. And that's extremely important as, again, as the use of toll facilities throughout the nation has continued to increase, as the use of express lanes has continued to increase, that's important. But also as facilities throughout the nation have done exactly what we've done and removed cash collection, you, you won't have an option other than uh, to use a transponder or to get a bill in the mail. And there are some states that uh, charge pretty heavily if you decide to use it to get a bill in the mail. Ours are pretty modest. We, if you get a bill in the mail, the toll rate is uh, slightly different, and then there's a $2.50 statement fee. Uh, but if you do that in the Northeast, you could, you could wind up with a much higher toll rate and a $30 um, administrative charge that they add. So having that portability of your transponder and your account across state lines is something that has been a focal point for, for us. Um, so for the SunPass Pro, you can use it in 22 states. The SunPass Mini has, has applicability outside of the state of Florida, but it is, uh, it's a little bit more limited. So I would always encourage folks to use the SunPass Pro. 
But the other thing is there's the portability for others that are using their, um, their uh, toll transponder from out of state in the state of Florida. Obviously, we are very focused on our visitors and we want to make sure that we are very welcoming. And so we accept transponders from, um, from all of these 21 states around the, the country. And so whether it's an easy pass that's the, the Northeast brand, or it's a, a toll tag from Texas, or a K tag from Kansas, those can all be used on our facilities. And so making it a little easier for our out-of-state visitors to, to travel on our Florida tollways is extraordinarily important to us. So we're, we're very proud of the fact that we are the most interoperable um, state in the nation. We also continue to look at safety, and so there are a number of, of safety, um, safety stats on this slide. Two of the most important things that, that we do on our roadways is our Road Ranger program. Um, our Road Ranger program is there to help stranded uh, vehicles along the side of the road or to help remove de debris off the roadway to avoid any type of incidents uh, because of debris. We also have a rapid incident clearance, right? We know what can happen not only to mobility when there is a wreck, but also with secondary crashes. Getting, um, getting an instant incident removed off the roadway is important, not only from a safety, but a mobility standpoint. And then we've invested quite a bit in technology, roadway, or sorry, wrong way detection systems. We continue to deploy those throughout our system. We also have an automated incident detection in our traffic management center. That means that we are alerted to incidents much quicker, and so our dispatch is much quicker, and that allows us to respond to incidents and get them cleared um, much faster. We're also looking at ramp speed signs and deploying those on our system, making sure that people know how fast they're going coming off of, of a ramp and knowing to, to slow down, um, providing that feedback to, to customers and helping them make uh, smart decisions as it, re as it relates to how they're moving on the roadway. We're also looking at other, um, other technologies as it relates to connected vehicle, um, information, queue warnings, um, those types of things to help provide that information to the roadway user. Our capital plan is extraordinarily robust. This is the Turnpike Enterprise capital plan over the next five years. So it includes the current year that we're in, fiscal 23, and the next five years out to fiscal 28. So again, just to kind of give a, a before and after look, um, our first five-year work program as a Turnpike Enterprise was $4.4 billion, and I can tell you we were really proud of that number back then. That was a pretty significant number. Um, today it's $11.7 billion, and I think that's pretty significant not only because it's, it's a robust plan, but also as you look at the way the investments are broken out, it's um, primarily focused on expansion. Those are new roadways to, to meet the transportation need. It's interchanges, new interchanges, interchange modifications. It's improving that access to the, to the system, um, both to our system and then to the adjacent roadways. It's $5 billion of widening in capacity, expanding our system, making sure that we're dealing with it, the congestion that we see on our existing facilities. And then a billion on preservation and safety, what we always want to do, and it is at the, the core of what we do, is make sure that we have a safe, well-maintained, and preserved system. So a billion dollars towards safety. All of this is, is built in a time where there are inflationary pressures. We, we certainly understand that. Um, but we've done it without adjusting our toll rates. Um, we haven't uh, changed our toll rates since 2017, and so we have pretty modest toll rates on a per mile basis. We have some of the lowest in the nation. Uh, we try to keep those, those low, and we try to look for operational efficiencies to ensure that our net revenues go back into the system, into improving the system, into adding new, new infrastructure along the roadway. So some of the improvements, as I talked about, incre increased capacity, 322 lane miles will be adding to uh, the roadway, 31 interchange improvements, and 10 new interchanges, again, new access points. 
So how does that relate to Polk? Well, in Polk County, we've got $600 million of strategic investments over the next five years. It's pretty significant, but I think also it, it goes to show just what, uh, what type of growth you're seeing here. The, the stats say it, we feel it, and so it's very significant. So our investments in Polk County mirror that. We want to make sure that we're accommodating future population growth um, and the regional connectivity, right? We know that it's not the four corners of just the county. We do know that regional connectivity is extraordinarily important. Enhancing freight and economic competitiveness, again, making sure that we have a robust supply chain is extremely important, not only locally, but to the entire state. And then also emergency response and evacuation is always one of the, the core items that we look at, making sure that we can, we can accommodate in those emergency situations. So talking about some current projects that we have under construction, um, again, we are um, we're widening the Polk Parkway. Uh, again, uh, the, the growth on the system has been pretty significant over the last several years. And so we are finally uh, widening that system. We are getting rid of the two-lane section. Um, and so we will have a fully widened uh, Polk Parkway in the next few years. And then also, as I mentioned, we've already converted the system to all electronic tolling, so we removed the cash collection from the lanes, but now we need to come back and do the civil work to make sure that it, it is complete, so removing the toll booths, removing really any, um, any of the legacy infrastructure from um, cash toll collection. And then very excited about the Central Polk Parkway. We had a wonderful groundbreaking event. I'm sure some of you were at just a few weeks ago. And so we have started construction on the six and a half mile section um, from the current Polk Parkway down to US 17. And, um, and then we're finishing up design on the next section from US 17 down to State Road 60. And that will be letting just um, a little over a year from now. So we're excited to get those projects underway and get them completed. And then, of course, as we know, the, the work isn't done. We saw, obviously, um, needs for relief from I-4 and US-27, I saw, was, was up there. And so we have a pd &E study for what we call the Central Polk Parkway East. We may be renaming that. Um, but, but we have a pd &E basically, that's taking a look at that uh, north-south connection between State Road 60 and the Point Siena Parkway. Um, as you can see, the, um, the brown line on there, if you can see, hmm, the southern piece of um, Toll 538, so that is the, the Polk Parkway, is uh, part of the Central Florida Expressway system. And the dashed lines show their project that they'll be constructing, um, I believe, beginning next year. But there is a missing piece from uh, County Road 532 that ties into I-4 and then to, to 429. Again, our focus is on regional connectivity. And so that is the Point Siena Parkway connector. And we will be, let me just go ahead and, we will be, um, we have uh, design and right-of-way funded for, for that project. Um, but the construction for that project, which is well over a billion dollars, um, that is part of the Moving Florida Forward initiative that Governor DeSantis announced um, here in this very facility, standing right over there just a couple of months ago. And so we want to make sure that um, Moving Florida Forward um, is passed um, and, and is appropriated and, uh, and will be funded for the years to come. We've got, uh, we're looking at fiscal 27 for construction for that facility. We couldn't do any of this without the partners in this room today. Again, I'm so pleased to be here with you all and I appreciate everything that the Polk Transportation Planning Organization does. Um, being forward thinking and making sure that you reach out to, to all of us, your transportation partners, so that we can find real solutions. So just so pleased please to be part of this and um, pleased to be invited to events that you all have to, to discuss the needs in Polk County. And so now talking a little bit about SunTrack. So again, we were very pleased to, to be able to have the opportunity to construct this facility. This was paid for um, through the Florida Turnpike Enterprise. 
And this started as an idea really in 2015, 2016, and it really was to meet the need that we had to test our toll technology. That was really at the, at the heart of everything, and it was a, an idea to meet a need, that, a very specific need that we had that really blossomed into um, the fantastic facility that you're gonna see today. So we broke ground on this project in 2017, and we completed the construction just this past year. Uh, we still have a few features that we're, we're working on, um, but, but largely the facility that you're seeing today is a completed facility, and actually it's a very active facility. So some of the features um, here at SunTrack, so a two and a quarter mile oval track, Again, to do quite a bit of testing from our toll technology standpoint, we have four specialized toll gantries. We have uh, three vendors throughout the turnpike system that we utilize for our toll technology. And so three of the four toll gantries that we have out here today mirror the facilities that we have in production. And so we have the ability to test out here before we deploy into production on our roadway network. And then there's a final one that really is used for, for any type of ad hoc testing that we wanna do. The infield that you'll see is uh, 200 acres. It has a number of different um, test sectors within it. Um, it has an advanced observation deck, that beautiful tower that you see. Um, and we have some warehousing that you'll uh, likely be going through. And then this facility that you're here today in, a 20,000 square foot welcome center. Um, it has offices, it has classrooms, it has a facility adjacent to it with a lot of, um, a lot of uh, conference rooms for, uh, for testing, for reviewing results, for, um, for collaboration in transportation solutions. So wonderful facility. Here, this, this photo really just shows the, the different test sectors that we have out here. Again, the, the facility um, more than speaks for itself. One thing that I wanted to highlight, though, is as I mentioned, you know, this started as a facility that was used to test our toll technology and then expanded far beyond that. Transportation is a very broad umbrella. Again, you know, going back to the, the exercise that we did this morning, taking a look at we need, uh, we need enhanced roadway, but also we do want to make sure that there are transit solutions and there are solutions that we can accommodate our vulnerable road users. And so being able to test some of those important technology applications right here in some of these test sectors, like our pickup and drop off sector, our urban and suburban sectors, those are gonna be incredibly important for, for testing some of those applications here in a controlled environment before um, taking them out into to production. So we're very excited that our, our infield really is a multimodal infield. SunTrax is a high-tech research and testing facility developed by the Florida Department of Transportation and Florida's Turnpike Enterprise. Centrally located in Auburndale, Florida, this state-of-the-art complex will serve as North America's next-generation platform for testing emerging transportation technologies. Situated on 475 acres, SunTrax consists of a high-speed oval track that loops 10 secured testing sectors built to accommodate customized testing configurations and conditions. Upon entering SunTrax, guests will be greeted by the iconic arrival and conference building. This unique structure is outfitted with smart technologies, flexible work areas, dining services, and indoor-outdoor event spaces. Past the security checkpoint lies a series of climate-controlled workshops. Within these buildings are 16 individual bays that can be co-joined to accommodate custom space requirements, house multiple oversized vehicles, and connect to a private service yard. In the southwest corner of the facility is the SunTrax geometry track. This undulating topography and irregular grade changes provide the ideal environment for testing CAV functionality in limited site distance conditions. SunTrax two and a quarter mile high speed oval track has a design speed of 70 miles per hour with a 10 degree incline at the corners consisting of five lane straightaways and houses four free flow toll gantries. 
the urban and suburban environments, along with pickup drop-off sectors, simulate a variety of configurations using custom shipping containers that can be fitted with facades and stacks to replicate a wide range of real-world scenarios. Cross-angle intersections and multi-lane roundabouts provide additional testing applications for up to eight vehicles at a time. The noise vibration and harshness track features eight pavement types to accommodate the testing of CAV cameras and machine vision systems, while the wet test track provides multiple low friction surfaces with an optioned water element for traction testing and braking maneuvers. A 24-acre specialty paved technology pad can support up to 50 vehicles and eight users simultaneously. Sample testing includes LiDAR radar detection, crash avoidance, and sensor configurations. Adjacent to the tech pad stands a 60-foot high observation tower with lobby, restrooms, and high-speed data connections for ease in monitoring and recording projects. SunTrax, accelerating the future of transportation. All right, real quickly, so just want to touch base on one of the priority projects that we have. So we know that um, electrification um, is a, a hot topic right now. Obviously, the, the vehicles on the roadways are starting to change, and there's a lot of questions really about, um, about EVs and what the solution is, what the right balance is. What we do know is that there are going to be um, more EVs on the, the roadways in the coming years. Still, as an overall um, percentage, it's still fairly low, but the adoption rate continues to, to increase, and we need to be prepared for that um, on our roadway networks. And so we started a number of years ago outfitting our service plazas along the Turnpike Main Line with EV charging stations. And so we went from having, I think, maybe 10 or 15 um, charging stations to having almost 100. And so what we want to do is make sure that that's an amenity that we can offer to folks that are, are using the Turnpike Main Line. But we also know, again, that there are a lot of questions about what the electrification of the, the roadway looks like. And so one of the things that we'll be testing in the coming years out here at, at SunTrax is what we're calling power tracks. And that is um, in motion wireless charging. And so there's a lot of questions about what the power draw is, what the efficiency is of, of that power in the vehicle, how that changes between a passenger vehicle and a commercial vehicle, um, the type of pavement that you use, the, the type of wear and tear and maintenance that's going to be required for that, all kinds of questions. And so one of the things that we'll be able to do here is, is test some of that right here in our own backyard and gather some important information. So I just, I will leave you with one more video that talks about that project. Thank you for indulging me in, in letting me talk about the things that are really important to us um, at the Department of Transportation and at Florida's Turnpike Enterprise. And most of all, thank you all for, for being here today. At SunTrax, America's new center for transportation innovation, our mission is to advance technology solutions that improve mobility and make transportation safer and more efficient. As electric vehicles transform our transportation landscape, we also realize that a few challenges stand in the way of full adoption. Challenges like range anxiety and the cost of vehicles and batteries, especially for bigger vehicles like freight trucks that need to power long trips. At SunTrax, we are piloting how we revolutionize smart electrified technology by powering the very roads that vehicles drive on. We will be doing real-world testing where we are advancing a wireless technology that allows electric vehicles to dynamically and safely charge as they drive over the lane. The Powertrax demonstrations will show first-of-its-kind applications that allow us to prepare for how we could deploy this technology on our roadways, including analyzing the power draw and different vehicle applications on one of the longest continuous smart-powered lanes testing high-speed travel up to 70 miles an hour, analyzing different electric vehicles from heavy-duty trucks to light-duty cars, evaluating real vehicle movements, such as lane changes, and eventually developing other policies and programs such as pricing and payment applications using telematics and technology in the vehicle. We are focused on how we build a sustainable future, pursuing solutions that could lower the cost to electrify vehicles, reduce transportation operation costs, improve fleet efficiency with electric vehicles that don't need to stop to fuel, and bring environmental benefits to the state of Florida. 
And with that, let me conclude uh, work zone safety. We have a lot of roadway construction going on and make sure to slow down and, um, and be mindful of our, um, our workers in the roadway. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Nicola, for a great presentation and for investing in Polk County. I know the Polk County and all 17 cities of Polk County, they, we really value our partnership with the Florida Turnpike Enterprise. So our second presentation today, our second keynote speaker is Mr. Frank Domingo. He's from Stantec, and he will be talking to us again about transportation technology and what's happening in our area. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me here today. So Smarter Mobility and Stantec, how many of you have heard of Stantec? Wow, that's good. Most people go, who? We're the biggest company that a lot of people have not heard of is how I usually advertise ourselves. And it, um, it's not a good tagline, but um, it's kind of true. But um, Stantec is uh, a global company. There's 20, we have 26,000 people um, across the world. Uh, a huge focus in North America, and we do about just about everything um, from transportation, water, buildings, um, power, mining, environmental, um, you name it, we, we do a little bit of everything. But enough of the commercial. Let's move on to the agenda. There's three things that I wanted to talk about, and I thought they were more relevant to, um, to Polk County. Um, talking about truck parking, freight movement. In this case, I'm going to speak to last mile delivery. Um, and then some of the multimodal trends. Um, the future of Brightline and some of the other rail, uh, rail services that are going to be coming through Polk County, they are going to really change the face. If you don't believe it, it will really change the face of what Polk County is going to be in the future. So I wanted to relate uh, a project that we're working on um, somewhere else in the world that actually might apply uh, to Polk County. And you might be surprised. I'd like to start off with a safety moment. That is an actual picture. Alligator mating season started on April 1st. And I wrote no foolin' because no foolin'. It lasts through June. Um, so when you're approaching your vehicle um, during this time, it is not a bad idea to take a look underneath. Just so you know, we our headquarters is in Canada, and when we sent our safety folks this picture, the term they freaked out a eh, was truly, uh, truly what um, they freaked out. But we're used to it here, right? But we can definitely. Um, Got to have that safety moment. So, you know, everybody asks, what's smarter mobility? And we have the standard, like, marketing sheet. Um, I view it, and I, I define it, and when I get to go out and speak, this is what I call it. It's the blending of mobility, community development, and land use and technology, and putting those things together to actually deliver, um, deliver solutions that actually work in the real world. Um, a little bit about myself, um, my background is I've, I've worked for 18 years in government, um, nine in state, nine in, nine in local government, um, nine in local government, I ended, was even the uh, county engineer for Sarasota County for a few years, um, and I've been in uh, the consulting world for 18 years, so 30, this year will be 36 years. And what I wanted to impart is, I do as much development work as I do public work. And what I found in my career um, in local government and in, uh, um, as a consultant is, public-private is the way to go. It's the reason, um, it's the reason I've been successful in my career and it's the reason that Things that I never thought could actually get built in my career actually did get built because of public-private partnerships. So let's talk about truck parking. Um, background, I looked at Stantec projects that we're working on that I've actually worked on and others have been working on. I did some research 
but I also took the time to interview at least one independent trucker and full, um, full disclosure, he's married to one of our sector leads, so he had to talk to me, but he was quite candid. And so I feel like um, I can relate some of the information that, that he um, experiences as an um, independent trucker. Um, some of the national statistics um, from Federal Highway Administration and American Trucking Associations. So there's three, the inventory, 313,000 truck parking spaces nationwide. 3.5 million truckers. Do the math. That's about one parking space for every 11 truckers, uh, drivers. Um, I think we might have a supply problem. Um, one of the things too, uh, according to Trend Magazine, lack of parking has been the top concern of drivers over the last three years. It hasn't been parking shortage, it hasn't been fuel prices, it hasn't even been safety, it has been parking. So, you know, I started reading this slide to folks and they said, golly, Frank, will you please give me a little good news? And the good news is there's three quarters of a billion dollars from federal grants dedicated to truck parking. That's a lot of money. But let's put some things in context. I'm gonna give you a little more st um, statistics. I try not to read to folks, but these highlighted pieces are really important. 98 of the drivers regularly experienced um, finding safe parking. Um, the truck parking shortage exists, you all know, you live in it, right? In, in, in the hot spots along major corridors. 70% of the drivers have been forced to violate federal um, service rules. That's a safety issue. A tired driver, a tired truck driver is even worse than, is probably your worst case scenario. They spend an average of 56 minutes of valuable driving time per day looking for parking. And that translates to lost compensation for them. You know, the, um, this number says it's about a 12% annual pay cut. As a consultant, if you do public work, you know what that translates to? That's your margin, that's your negotiated margin, that's your profit. So if you think about that, um, there are a huge bunch of challenges. One of the other things that I actually also studied, because this should be obvious, I should look at the Florida Department of Transportation statewide parking study from 2020. It's a good study. Um, and I, what I wanted to do is I took a look at what was in it, and then I'm taking a deeper dive into how does that apply for, um, for implementation. Um, I'm not gonna read you the methodology, but it's a valid point, right? They collected data, they did surveys, um, you come up with solutions, you apply, um, you apply the constraints. But my big takeaway was there's 10,000 parking spaces roughly in the state of Florida for trucks. 30% are public, 70% are private. 30% are public, 70% are private. I'm gonna, if I say it three times, 30% are public, 70% are private, I think Beetlejuice is gonna show up. But what that means is the government alone is not going to solve this problem. And it's obvious because the conclusions in the study are technology, actually they wrote technology, I wrote technology and I added communications because those two are so vital. Partnerships and policy and regulatory solutions. Does anybody see anywhere that said the state is gonna try and build its way out of this problem by themselves? And the answer is no, not at all. Um, in a nutshell, this is um, the District 1 um, summary. They need 3,400 additional spaces today, and by 2030, they need nearly 5,000 parking spaces and their hot spots through District 1. I just, wow, right? Will you please, Frank, give us a little good news? Well, there is some good news. I-4 parking facility. Uh, between Tampa and Orlando, 18,000 trucks a day. You guys all know, y'all y'all know this. Um, so what does it bring you? 120 spaces, electric hookups, pedestrian infrastructure with access 
to nearby commercial amenities. And I said, what do you mean by commercial amenities? Are they, are they really walking the walk? And the answer is, it's right next to Taco Bus. And the answer is yes. Yes, because Taco Bus rocks. So I'm just telling you that, uh, so, you know, it could have been anything, but Taco Bus means they care, okay? That's what that means. So, an infra grant funding for $15 million, awesome, federal funding. Total cost, $16 million and change. What does that convert to? Do the math, 120 parking spaces. $136,000 a space for a surface parking lot. I mostly do development. I mostly do parking garages. You know how much that is compared to a parking garage space? It's almost triple. Almost triple. So context, how much of that federal money do we need in District 1 alone? And the answer is pert near all of it. That's why the solutions are different. And I draw it in a cycle, technology, communications, partnerships, policy, and regulatory, because they all feed off each other. They are all interrelated. You cannot do one without another. One thing isn't going to, there is not a silver bullet that's one solution. It is a bunch of little solutions painstakingly implemented going through this little circle. I like to call it the circle of life. Some people call it the circle of death, but that's what you have to do. So let's talk about communications and technology. Little research. The state's leading this. Excellent. The, the TPAS, right? They've linked up. They, they can count and sell you when all of their spaces are occupied and not occupied. There are trucker apps. The top five, according to, um, to Google, I just love the name, so I'm going to read them to you, okay? So Dat Trucker, Truck Bubba, Trucker Path, a little dull, Park My Truck App, and Road Breakers. Love it. This is a little screenshot of one of the, uh, one of the apps. And at the bottom, all these folks who already provide trucking and trucking services, loves Flying J, TA, et cetera. They're actually interlinked. Um, when Nicola talked about interoperability, that's what they're talking about here, right? The power of a, of a cell phone, realizing that it can be used for something other than watching cat and dog videos, right? It can be. So bear with me. The other one is Park Trucking Club, which is a, a website. I thought this app was great. Um, and I'm going to read you what their little uh, thing is. It says, they basically link business, businesses across different sectors, trucking companies with extra spaces, self-storage companies, industrial real estate companies, landowners with vacant lots in 12 states, and they can earn money by allowing truckers to park, park on their property. You know what that is? It's a dating app for truck parking. <laughs> it is match.com for truck parking, and I said, my gosh, we need to put that thing on steroids. But for all the good implementation, right, this is the beauty of the United States is we'll implement first and then figure out how did we break everything else when we did this. I love that part of being in this country. But when you roll in all those other things, technology, parking, and partnerships, and policy, and regulation, therein lies the challenge, right? Um, I spoke to my trucker buddy and he said, apps are great, but paid parking is still unreliable because of the supply issues. You saw the supply numbers, right? I showed those to you and it's, it's just like the airlines. What happens? They overbook and they're unreliable. You show up if you're to park and there is not a space for you there, even if you were gonna pay for it, because guess why? There's just not enough. You're like, thank you, Captain Obvious. I didn't expect that you were gonna be speaking today. Um, so the truck, parking, the truck Parking Club has its rates on here. It's $20 a day, $200 a month is the average, according to that website. And I'm sorry about the graphic. It's not, doesn't show up that great, but 
The other challenge is, is I asked my trucking buddy again, I said, hey, well, we've got all of this. I mean, here's some options, and he went. The issue is, for long haul truckers, local parking gets taken up by local truckers because they can't park their trucks at their houses or they're limited in the options that they have there. So that is a foreshadowing of the public or the regulation and the policy issues. So we've got to form these partnerships, right? If we're focusing on partnerships, this came straight out of the, the, the parking study, at least the first one. Develop P3 mo models for urban and rural areas. I'm all, you've got to come up with some type of agreements to make these work, right? That is, that is the secret to speed. This, P3s are speed, because what you've done is you've combined resources and money and um, a collective desire for an outcome to actually achieve it. That's my definition of P3. Um, I've added in redevelopment areas. There are a lot of opportunities for redevelopment areas to potentially convert to uh, truck parking. And the next three, when somebody, when Grammar checked me and it said, hey, Frank, you've got three of the same bullets, because that's one of the biggest challenges. As a former regulator, if, when you're a regulator and then you become a consultant, and then you go and try and permit your, through your regulations, the toughest lesson is, man, I just totally like painted myself into a corner by making that regulation. And um, being, a ra being raised a Catholic, of course, um, I had to suffer the penance of working through my own bed that I just basically had to go sleep in. So the biggest impediment may be policy and regulatory times three. Yes, that actually might be the hardest part because, you know, there's a reason there's, those things exist. I'm going to give you a redevelopment example that I've been looking at this parcel for decades. Um, I had to do one in, in Sarasota because I don't live in Polk County, but I want to give you an idea of what, what this is. This used to be Kmart, and now it's Burlington Coat Factory. It's what they call a second tier strip, strip development, right? And over time, what happens to those? They don't look too pretty 10, 20 years later, and that's where we're at here. But what I saw on this aerial map is, look at all that parking. Look at all that parking. And if you're worried about compatibility, it's, it's surrounded by, well, there's a McDonald's there. You can clearly see that. But an arterial roadway in the interstate. So the neighbors aren't really going to complain about the noise. Um, what does it also have? Lodging. There's a Hampton Inn to the north. Um, there's a bunch of restaurants, which is great. Um, there's grocery, there's a Publix just to the, uh, just to the west. There's even healthcare in a couple places. There's a doctor's hospital um, just across the way as well. And if you wanted to, you could actually ride the bus around if you wanted to, because there's actually bus stops right in front of this, right in front of this parcel. And for security, which is another concern about truck parking, there's actually a sheriff's office half a mile away, and I happen to know that they drive by this place all the time. And I said, you know, it is like the planets are aligned. This is Match.com. I'm swiping, what is it, right? I don't even know what it is. I've been married so long. But the big question about policy and regulation is, is it an acceptable distance from the residential? And the residential is down in the lower left corner. Um, it's about 800 feet from the corner, 1,000 from where I'm thinking I'm going to put the, park, the, the trucks. Now, does this owner know that I'm doing this with his parcel? No. But it's a free country and a guy can dream, right? Some people dream about cars. I dream about truck parking. So 
In my defense for it, is that too close? Some people will say yes, but I will say that they moved in after, I will say, the Publix and the Big Lots, were, or Ollie's, were there. And that little alleyway that you see in orange there, that's the truck route. They moved in next to the truck route. So I'm thinking, I already have a white noise generator that's gonna block out the sound because they already live next to the trucks. If I park a bunch of trucks at this other one, that they're not gonna have a problem. But my advice to you on this, my little case here is, this is what you gotta look for, is this is opportunity. Some people say an old Kmart, an old Burlington coat, I see opportunity. And I'm also a consultant, so I smell money as well. But, you know, but that's, that's, that's how this works. That's how a public-private partnership starts. These are the components. It has everything you need. It has bike lanes, it has sidewalks, it has transit. And it has like 15 different restaurants. You can get Chinese there, I think there's even, actually there's a Ukrainian restaurant right around the corner from it too, if you're really uh, craving, um, actually I don't know what you get there, pierogies? That's Polish, right? But you know what I mean? There is, I mean, that's, that's what you've got. And I have no idea on track of time, so I'm going to try and move this on. Um, Parag's going to give me the notice, I'm sure. I'm going to move to policy and regulatory. The first thing you do when you see, when you look for truck parking on Adobe imagery, sadly, this is what comes up. <laughs> Tells you what what they're always facing. Um, it's a challenge, right? So policy and regulation, what are the steps that the DOT said to go move forward? Leverage grant funding, absolutely. All the different types that are available. I think it's beyond, um, it's beyond transportation grants too. It's economic development because some of this it's technology grants. You have to bundle those. When, I talk about bun when we talk about bundling opportunity, that's the other opportunity that needs to be bundled. Um, advise MPOs and local agencies to improve roadway, uh, right away and the curbside. Absolutely. You always hope that when you put in a new facility that um, if, the, if the infrastructure, local infrastructure is not there to support it, the capital improvement program needs to come in and actually make that improvement and connect up. It needs to be coordinated as best as you can. Um, again, you'll see this recurring theme, policy and regulatory flexibility for truck parking. There's a reason that there's regulation that says, hey, it shouldn't be this close to residential, there shouldn't be incompatible uses, understand that, but time does not stand still and strip commercial rots over time and where is where's where's commercial going in retail it's not exactly like knocking it out of the park i'm thinking there's going to be a lot more opportunities so the evolution of regulation needs to go in and accommodate that so um i'm not going to read you the last one but you're looking at this picture and going why did he put truck parking and this little micro mobility station that got built on, in, on Lido Key, um, and the answer is um, that trucker friend of mine was in Houston, and he found, got lucky and found parking, but then it was an hour walk to get to the hotel. He had driven for 14 hours, and he was in Houston, so wasn't exactly like cool, and he had to walk that. What did he do? I couldn't believe it, my worlds collided. He got an e-scooter, and he kept an e-scooter in his vehicle, and basically when he has to take it, and there's facilities to go to it, he took an e-scooter to where he was gonna go stay, and it cut his travel down by, uh, by a quarter. I mean, it, it quartered his time for getting there. So, but not all is a happy ending on that one. Unfortunately, somebody stole his e-scooter eventually. So my take on it is, hey, 
if we had like a remote truck parking and we had, and we actually had these folks, one of the public uh, private providers come in and provide these for you, would you use it? And he goes, oh yeah, absolutely. Especially like the newer scooters, not even a stand-up scooter. You can get a sit-down one, you can carry stuff on it, you can get an e-bike, you can get a bike pedal one if you really want to get some exercise. And so, I know it sounds weird, but this juxtaposition, I do feel like it's already happened, I just didn't know it, and we didn't know it, and it's actually a possibility. So I'm gonna move to the next thing. Freight movement, last mile movement. Not to brag, but I got to go to London and what it last um, in, in August. And being a good, smarter mobility person, what did I do? I took, did I go to Big Bend? Did Big Bend, excuse me, did I go to, I did go to the Opera House, but um, I didn't do all any of that stuff. I took pictures of little mobility hubs, and on the right, I couldn't believe it, this little UPS delivery thing, it's electric, it's small. What do you do when you're space constrained? And I went, oh my God, this is, I kept taking pictures and my boss kept going, what are you doing? These are you, oh, what are you doing? These are ubiquitous. You know, they've been here for 10 years. I saw one for DHL, FedEx, you name it, every delivery, this is what they're doing. They found a different way. Space constrained, where can we fit a truck? In, there, in England, they call it a lorry. Okay. You guys have a different word for everything. Um, the other picture is New York City. That's what FedEx is using. They're using the public sidewalk to go and stage their stuff up. I mean, it's got so extreme in Manhattan is they're actually thinking about allowing the garbage trucks to drive on the sidewalks to pick up the garbage at one o'clock in the morning when there's no peds. That's how extreme the space crunch is. And as Polk County grows, that's kind of, you know, that could be your future or, if, or you could choose a different path. Last mile delivery, I, I did see some guy on a cargo bike making a delivery, but I couldn't use the image. I took a picture of him, but he was because he wasn't wearing a helmet and our health and safety team says you can't show a picture of somebody on a bike without a helmet unless you're talking about bike safety, but in this case, I just used Adobe. So, last mile delivery, when you're talking about um, where do they park now, they park in the lanes, right? You see them in the continuous two-way left turn lanes pulling beer and sending it out. My take on it is this is down in um, Naples. Um, they got a big lots with an empty parking lot and they are worried about, they've got narrow, narrow side streets, shallow commercial lots. They can't get trucks in so they're parking in the and the arterial roadway. My take is find a different way, stage up, make a, make a deal with big lots, stage up, redistribute, deliver in a different method, and create some jobs and maybe get some exercise while you're at it. I think, it's a, I think that's, that's one of the options. So I, of course, have gone on, but I want to talk about rail connectivity and suburban master planning. In England, there's not a lot of land. So every time they new develop a new development, they want to make it absolutely count. So I've looked at how much my house is worth in this particular area. By the way, it's, it's spelled Otterpool. They pronounce it Otterpaul. I don't understand how the English speak English, but there you are. Really cool things, though. There is a rail station in the middle of nowhere, as they say. There's some bus service. but. They're planning 8,000 dwelling units in eight phases of development. And they came to us and said, in order to make this, um, in order to make this affordable, we really need to get, um, get them car free as possible. How do we do that when we're selling houses for a million dollars? And I said, hmm, they're probably, why don't you do one car? And so what we did was set up a, um, a hierarchy of mobility hubs. Because what we wanted to do is do first mile, last mile, and first two mile, first three mile, or more to get to the actual rail station so you could get to the major employment centers. So I'm gonna buzz through these a little bit. You want it to be scalable. 
You want it to be flexible so you could actually grow into it and decide, hey, if I need more, um, if I need more bikes, e-bikes or scooters, or do I need EV car share? Um, that's a possibility. So this is kind of our vision of what it would look like in 3D. I love working on with architects because they always give me a 3D picture. But um, if you look on the top of that roof, um, I told them, I want you to add vertical takeoff and landing because if we really are futuristic, let's talk about that as well. So let's add another mode. So while there's a train in the background, all the other things are kind of more feel good, but they also work. Um, they work at the human scale. Um, a community hub gets a little bit, um, gets a little, um, a little bit different, right? It is first line, last line, but there's intra-community travel if it's big enough. Um, you get a range of vehicles, and mobility as a service is something that's actually ramping up over there. Everything from EV car share to scooters to car um, to uh, scooter sharing. But I says I gotta Americanize this, so I put in golf carts because if there's anything that I know that Floridians love, if you they they love their golf carts. And guess what? It can be clean, it's an option, it's affordable, it takes up less space. I mean, what could, other than letting kids drive, what else, what could go wrong? For the most part, I think it's a great idea. And the last is, and I was driving on my way here, I saw the trail, the Van, uh, the Van Fleet Trail, and I said, well, they're planning a trail, and what do they do? It's a recreational hub. We love our trails in Florida, right? Recreational hub is for leisure, but it also, in, in this, particular instance, we actually designed them to connect the schools because so you could actually take another map, another route. No car-related options at the recreational hub. It's a statement, but it's also like, if you're gonna come here, really enjoy it, and, and it's not like we haven't given you a million choices. And I always have a question slide, but I also know I'm out of time, and I, not too bad. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, for this great and a passionate presentation. Uh, it's always good to see what other communities are working on. So now we are at our panel discussion. I will invite our three speakers to, uh, to come over here. Uh, yesterday we were saying this is sort of a timeout table. Uh, so we have uh, the way this panel discussion will work. Uh, the, uh, first of all, the first three speakers, the three speakers will talk about the great work which their agencies are doing for 15 minutes, and then we have question and answers for around half an hour. So the three keynote speakers which we have today are, number one, we have uh, Mr. John Kubler, who is the Interim District 1 Secretary. Uh, I have small bios which I will be reading for each of these individual speakers. Mr. John Kubler has more than 38 years of experience in the transportation industry and has worked in both public and private sectors. He has served more than 31 years in District 7 and in District 1. John received his bachelor's in civil engineering from the University of South Florida and is a registered professional engineer in Florida. The second speaker, the second speaker we have is Mr. Bill Beasley. Mr. Bill Beasley is the county manager of Polk County. Mr. Bill Beasley, Mr. Bill Beasley began as the county manager in August of 2019. Prior to that, Bill was a deputy county manager for Infrastructure Group, a position he held for 13 years. Prior to Bill's tenure with Polk County, he served in various engineering and administrative capacities at, Virg at Virginia Department of Transportation, the US Department of Navy, and the local governments of Charlotte in the North Carolina area. Bill holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the Pennsylvania State University and a master's in engineering administration from George Washington University. And the third speaker we have today is the Mr. Tom Phillips, Tom came to us from Minnesota. 
Citrus Connections Executive Director Tom Phillips' arrival in Lakeland seven years ago from Pace Suburban Bus in Chicago has added an innovative approach to public transportation in Polk County, resulting in a merger of all county transit systems while still keeping a good stewards of taxpayers' dollars. A Minnesota native, Phillips brings 15 years of transit experience to the table, which has already enabled him to increase ridership by 27%, reducing operating costs by 8.6%, and refunding more than $100,000 to the Polk County Board of County Commissioners. So with these small bios, I will invite Mr. John Kubler to come here and give and tell us about the excellent work where District 1 is working on in Polk County. Well, good morning, and thank you for allowing me to come here today and speak with you all. So I'm John Kubler, Interim District 1 Secretary for Florida DOT. So the framework for freedom budget for fiscal year 23-24 as announced by Governor Ron DeSantis in early February proposes another historic investment in transportation infrastructure at $14.7 billion. This includes $13.4 billion for a work program with diverse and robust projects. It addresses congestion and enhances safety on major roadways and it enhances and facilitates a healthy supply chain, promotes economic growth, and prepares Florida for the future. Got it, okay. Secretary Perdue joined the governor in early February to announce the Moving Florida Forward Infrastructure Initiative. Since then, our communities have made it clear that this is a very much needed and highly anticipated proposal for our residents, our visitors, and our economy. This interdependent plan consists of $4 billion of general revenue surplus over the next four years, $3 billion from FDOT by leveraging innovative financing tools, contracting methods, and policy proposals. This proposed funding will help to achieve the vision and deliver the projects in which FDOT has been working closely with our communities and our partners for years. The Moving Florida Forward Infrastructure Initiative expedites 20 major interstate and arterial roadway projects over the next four years, starting this next budget year. These projects will relieve congestion, enhance safety, ensure resiliency, and promote economic growth. There's tremendous local support, and these projects are already vetted and endorsed by local communities. The projects included in Moving Florida Forward are layered on top of our existing work program. More information about the initiative can be found at fdot.gov forward slash moving Florida Forward. We're very excited to share that of the eight of these projects that are highlighted here fall within District 1, and I'll discuss a few that have some impacts on the Polk County region. I-4 at State Road 33 Interchange. This project is located within the northern boundary of the city of Lakeland. The project will make major modifications to the interchange and add lanes to State Road 33 from Old Cumby Road to north of Tom Cow Road. Additional, additionally, we'll be providing wildlife crossings along this stretch of roadway. This construction contract consists of four different design projects that will be combined to provide nearly $200 million of improvements to this developing area as early as this next fiscal year. I-4 from US-27 to Champions Gate, and yes, this is the one you've all been waiting for, that Champions Gate is the key, right? That's kind of like the area where it all gets congested. This project, as proposed, will reconstruct I-4 to accommodate three general use lanes, create new auxiliary lanes, and create two special use lanes through this highly congested section of interstate. As you're all aware, this is a very much needed project, and the $635 million of improvements could be started as early as fiscal year 27. In addition to these proposed projects within Polk County, there is a project just outside the Polk County border within Osceola County. I-4 from Champions Gate 
to Osceola Parkway. This project, as proposed, will reconstruct I-4 to accommodate three general use lanes, auxiliary lanes, and two special use lanes in the eastbound and westbound directions from County Road 532, which is Champions Gate, to east of County Road 522, Osceola Parkway. Reconstruction of existing interchange is also part of this project. It's another very much needed project and the $1.45 billion of improvements could be started as early as the next fiscal year. District 1 resurfacing program from fiscal year 23 through fiscal year 28. One of the department's primary purposes is to maintain assets that we currently have. The funding for these activities is allocated based on needs before any new projects or capacity projects are funded. These maintenance activities focus on resurfacing the existing roadways and maintaining or replacing our bridges. Recently, we have needed to increase our funding towards resurfacing. Resurfacing in terms of lane miles, as you can see in the graph here, we have 2,140 total lane miles on the state highway system in District 1 between fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 28. District 1 will peak in lane mile targets in fiscal year 26 at 524 lane miles. That's nearly double the number of lane miles where we were back in 2020, 2021. In terms of construction costs, this represents $1.5 billion over the same time period. It's noteworthy that in fiscal year 24, which begins in just a few months, there's 11 resurfacing projects proposed on state roads in various locations throughout Polk County. Okay. So Polk TPO priority projects funded for construction in this current year, fiscal year 23, include US 98 widening from north of West Socrum Loop Road to south of County Road 54. This project will widen 8.7 miles of US 98 from two to four lanes and enhance safety. Our neighboring district, District 7, is working on adjacent projects to the north that will significantly improve mobility from Lakeland to Dade City. This project will also include some roundabouts at some key intersections. The roundabouts are very successful in reducing fatal and serious injury crashes while reducing speeds. This project is scheduled for bid opening as a design build. In fact, we just opened the bids yesterday and the estimated cost is 122 million and that's right about where the bids came in. US 98 John Singletary Bridge over Peace River. This bridge replacement project in Fort Meade has been a priority of Fort Meade and Polk County for many years. The existing bridge built in 1931 is 92 years old and with a theoretical life of 50 years, it's way past time to replace that bridge. The bridge is very narrow and there have been very, very uh, significant number of side swipe incidents. The new bridge will be built parallel to existing bridge and there will be a piece of the historic bridge railing carefully removed and displayed in the, in the park nearby, allowing a piece of the area's history to be preserved for future generations. There is a companion drainage project associated with this bridge project. The general scope for this project is to install drainage inlets, pipes, and ditches, and connect to the adjacent storm sewer system. The drainage conveyance will outfall to a proposed stormwater pond, which will enhance water quality prior to discharging to the Peace River. As a result of the drainage improvement, there will be milling and resurfacing throughout the limits, as well as sidewalk reconstruction. This project is scheduled to let to construction in the current fiscal year 23 at an estimated cost of $21 million. Polk TPO priority projects funded for construction in fiscal year 24 include the following. State Road 33, Lakeland Hills Boulevard from Parkview to Granada. Located in the medical district, this project is currently under design to reconstruct this corridor. The improved corridor will provide a new drainage system to alleviate historic flooding during heavy rain events. The roadway is being designed with a multimodal emphasis meaning that it will include median access management improvements throughout, 
mid-block pedestrian crossings, transit stops, and eight-foot wide sidewalks will be provided on both sides of the corridor. While we anticipate construction impacts to cause some significant lane closures through the area during the construction period, the ultimate improvements to this facility are greatly needed. Construction is scheduled to start late fiscal year 2024. US 98 from south of Griffin Road to Sharon Drive. This project is currently under design for resurfacing and in some isolated areas, full depth flexible pavement reconstruction to allow for upgrades to the drainage system. The orange locations in the picture provided are the locations identified for the full depth reconstruction. In addition to the resurfacing element of the project, this project incorporates many of the community desired improvements as identified in a planning study known as the Lakeland Area Alternatives Analysis, or Lakeland AAA. This project will provide wider sidewalks, ADA accommodations, median improvements, upgraded corridor lighting, and will provide pedestrian features at the Pyramid Parkway intersection by adding crosswalks on all sides of the intersection. The enhanced elements of this project will provide the City of Lakeland and Citrus Connection the opportunity to begin incorporating their rapid transit route for buses. Construction is scheduled for fiscal year 24. State Road 572 Drainfield Road at Waring Road. This project will convert a signalized intersection to a multi-lane roundabout at State Road 572 and Waring Road. The intent of this project is to improve safety and operations at the intersection upgrade the drainage system and provide pedestrian enhancements. Pedestrian enhan enhancements include features such as curb ramps, sidewalks, rectangular rapid flashing beacons, which will provide for a safer facility. A side benefit of the roundabouts is they help for air quality by reducing vehicle idle time and they enhance the transportation system from a, res a resiliency standpoint. As experienced in Hurricane Ian, in order to get signalized intersections operating while electric power was being restored, a generator was needed at each signal location. Construction is scheduled for late fiscal year 24. County Road 664, County Line Road over Peace River. This is an off-system bridge replacement due to structural deficiency. The county line is on the center line of the roadway and bridge alignment. Polk County is to the north and Hardy County is to the south. The project also includes roadway resurfacing, some limited reconstruction, new signing and pavement markings, and upgrading of the drainage system. Again, this project will start construction in fiscal year 24. Following projects I'm going to show you here are not funded for construction yet, but are still of significant local interest. Cumbie Road Complete Streets. The PD&E study on Cumbie Road was completed last year and design has begun. The study identified the need for improvements from US 98 to North Crystal Lake Drive, including reconstructing Cumbie Road with a 13-foot wide two-way left turn lane, one 12-foot travel lane in each direction, and eight-foot wide sidewalk on both sides. Roundabouts are proposed at the intersections of Main Avenue and Skyview Drive. The proposed improvements would require FDOT to acquire right-of-way to accommodate intersection improvements at US 98, Main Avenue, Commerce Point Drive, and Skyview Drive. At this time, no funding has been identified to move the project forward for right-of-way acquisition or construction phases, but it remains a high priority for the Polk TPO. This project incorporates many multimodal enhancements due to the high pedestrian and bicycle usage in the corridor. Lakeland Intermodal Center. The city of Lakeland desires to relocate and enhance the existing Citrus Connection downtown transfer station. A feasibility study for the Lakeland Intermodal Center was completed in 2020 with a recommendation for the RP funding site. A PD&E study is funded in the current fiscal year to move this project forward. The department is working with Polk County, the City of Lakeland, and Citrus Connection to get this PD&E study underway. The new facility will allow for modal transfer, 
significantly increasing a person's ability to come to Lakeland to conduct business, to visit family, or simply enjoy the city. Initial discussions include moving the Amtrak station from Lake Mirror to this new location, and in the future, there is hope that SunRail will eventually extend service to Lakeland. And again, the project is currently not funded for construction. New Jersey Pedestrian Bridge. The PD&E study for the pedestrian bridge crossing over CSX in downtown Lakeland was completed in 2019. The project is currently in a design phase to connect the New York cycle track to the Lake Wire area and the anticipated community redevelopment. And again, not funded for construction yet. So every presentation has to end with a safety message. April is Distracted Driving Awareness Month. We're all guilty of driving distracted. It's easy whether it's from eating, drinking, using the phone, or interacting with passengers. However, it only takes one second to change a life forever. Please don't drive distracted. Nothing is as important as your life and the lives of those around you. Thank you. I didn't get that message. You know, it, it, the, county's, the county's roadway budget, I think, pales in comparison to what you see with Florida Turnpike and what DOT's doing. But what, what, is, what is really reassuring is, is that the counties, uh, all of it collectively complement one another. So I, I think you're going to hear some, some collectively that, that, that what's happening in Polk County is really very progressive. And it's, it's really um, meant to, to touch people who live, work, recreate, who visit here. Um, but on the county side, I'm going to touch on only a handful of projects in basically two groups. One group is a group that's fully funded, that is in some phase of production, whether that be design, right-of-way acquisition, construction. The second grouping is relating to projects that are queuing up, that the board has assigned a priority to, and that we're moving them into a phase of execution. Um, and, and I'll touch on a few other smaller things, but one of the things I want to share about you, I, this photo is one of our recent roundabouts. If you've listened to what, at least what the DOT is saying and what some of the municipalities are saying, get used to roundabouts. They are in vogue, but they really are a safety improvement, and I'll share that with you in just a moment. Uh, I'm going to, the first couple of projects are, again, I said, are projects that are in execution. They are in production. We are moving forward in some phase or fashion with those. They are fully funded projects. The first one, if you've been down West Pipkin Road, you know how inconvenient that is. West Pipkin Road is about a four-mile project, just under $60 million in construction, anticipated to be finished about summer, fall of next year. Lake Wilson Road, this is up in the northeast sector of the county. This is just over a one mile segment of roadway. This rock project is under construction. It connects County Road 54, Ronald Reagan Parkway, to Osceola County Road 532. I'll tell you about this project. While this is a very urban corridor, it's a very congested corridor, uh, this probably is the single most expensive one mile of roadway that, the, that Polk County will ever build. You look at that number, about just over 40, uh, just under $44 million all in for 1.1 mile of roadway, $40 million for one mile of roadway. That's, that's the new norm in congested corridors. Here are two projects that are in production. County Road 557, that's just outside of, uh, it's in the uh, Lake Alfred area going up to the I-4 community. It's about six, seven miles of roadway. Uh, this, this project is in, I think design is essentially complete. We're going through additional phases of the right-of-way acquisition. Our goal is to have this thing under construction sometime uh, in the mid-summer of next year, but, and it will probably take several years to build. Uh, I mentioned to you that about the roundabouts. There will be two roundabouts on this segment of roadway right here at Old Polk City Road, and I think the other is where 5, 557A come in right around in here. This Marigold, Marigold is up in the Poinciana community. This is about a two, two and a quarter mile segment of roadway. We're going to widen an existing roadway from Cypress Parkway down to Palmetto Street. Uh, again, the Poinciana community, very congested community, very narrow roadway. 
What's not funded yet is the extension of widening improvements from Marigold all the way down to Lake Hatchnahal. Northridge Trail, this is, this is a new road. This is not an existing road. This is a road that's been in the planning stages for probably 15 years. Uh, our partners at the state have been gracious to us. This is a, 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 it's a backage road, essentially. If you look 27, it will parallel 27 running north and south. It'll be just to the west of 27. The county has gone through and completed the design. We've acquired all the necessary right of way. So we're in the process of, it's an old design. We're updating that design. This is about a four mile segment of roadway, $20 million. The state, uh, through state appropriations, the state has provided the county about $14 million to complete this project. Again, these are pro many of these, pro if not all of these projects, I think we've got strong support from our TPO, from our DOT, and from our state legislators. Everybody has, has, uh, has really participated in this, but this is uh, expected to you know, go to construction later this fall. This is a challenge. This is a big, the next project is a huge investment in Polk County. This is the Thompson Nursery Road um, realignment, extension, widening. Uh, Thompson Nursery will be done in two phases. Phase one has four segments. Phase two has one segment. Phase uh, one here, uh, we're estimating that if about $155 million. This phase of the project is about 6.4 miles. Phase two will be about 2.8 miles. But what you're going to see here is my wife does let me have the button, and if I mess it up, I call her. What you're going to see here, this starts at 17, State Road 17, and the project will ultimately end at State Road 27. Phase one, four segments. Phase segment one through here. Segment two, we're still looking at the alignment on where, where, what that's going to look like. Segment three has been nailed down in terms of alignment, and segment four is nailed down in terms of alignment. Portions of segment three are actually under construction now through a developer agreement. We're hoping to start construction on segment one sometime in the uh, late 23, late this year, early next year. But again, Thompson Nursery, this is an important east-west corridor that connects 17 to 27. This is a major initiative on the county, fully funded for phase one at $150 million. Phase two is right here, uh, West Lake uh, Ruby Drive, and then we'll connect to, to 27 here. Um, about 50, $55 million in investment. That, again, is going to be the second phase of the project. Uh, while we say there's two phases, four segments, one segment, in all likelihood it will look like, when we're executing this project, it will look like they're all of it under construction at one time. But that's a major investment, almost $200 million in one roadway project. Now I want to talk about a couple of projects that are not in any phase of, of design, right-of-way acquisition, construction. These are the next priority grouping as assigned by the county commissioners that we're starting to queue up now. Kathleen Road. Uh, John had talked to you a little bit about uh, what's going to be happening on State Road 98 as you head north into uh, Pasco County and up toward Dade City. Polk County, 10 years ago, made probably a $40, $50 million investment in widening Kathleen Road up to Duff Road. We're going to take Kathleen Road and extend that widening from D Duff Road north. And here, we're going to start creating a new segment of roadway that will interconnect or have an intersection connection at Rock Ridge Road there at 98. So again, Kathleen Road extension estimated at $100 million. We are chasing um, um, state and federal appropriations to help us support this project to the tune of five and, and, and two and a half million dollars. This is just starting some phase of PD&E alignment review, but it has become a priority project for the County Commission. The next one, Powerline Road, a major project, another north-south route that is, will be to the east of 1727. We've got to do something to relieve some pressure off of 1792, scenic 17, as well as 27. Powerline Road is probably a 10-mile segment of roadway that will be built in multiple sections. 
This segment starts right up here just north of in Davenport and will go down to try to connect into Scenic 17. I'll tell you, the county has already approved the first piece of this project, $10 million investment. A developer is starting to build that now. The middle section is from around South Boulevard, south to, uh, I think, Henson Avenue. And then there's a, the, the, the rest of it goes south uh, through past Hatchnahaw and ultimately into Scenic 17. This is a fairly new project in terms of what we envision. Uh, it's estimated at $160 million. We are chasing both state and federal appropriations for this project, but it is the next in one of a grouping of priority projects that we think is important for the long-term future of Polk County. FDC Holly Hill Road, both one's on the west side, one's on the east side of 27. We're looking at alignment studies. Uh, what I want the takeaway here is, is that these are priority of, uh, of, of projects. Look at what may be envisioned as another over, a western overpass on, on uh, over top I-4, just west of 27 that would connect to what is the Northridge Trail. I mentioned to you the Northridge Trail just a few moments ago. This would connect from the Northridge Trail back across I-4 and come back down into the FDC Grove Corridor. That is a project that is gaining priority with the County Commission and we are chasing and have received the first four million of federal, federal appropriations to, to start looking at the design alignment and right-of-way acquisition for this project. On the other side, Holly Hill Road, uh, Based on some development, there's not a whole lot we can do north of Holly Hill Road here, but we do believe there is some improvements that need to be made along Holly Hill Road uh, as it uh, comes back into through Florida Development Road on 27. So we think that corridor needs to be improved. And again, that's a priority uh, project for the County Commission. The other side I wanted to mention to you, look at this project here, Grandview Parkway. John had mentioned to you a little bit about some of the state funding for the I-4 corridor between Osceola and Polk County, specifically US-27. The county has had a long-time vision of having an eastern overpass east of 27. We call it the Grandview Parkway flyover. If you noticed, there's a cul-de-sac at dead ends here. This is Dunson Road over here. We have always envisioned an overpass that connects these two as another, again, a backage local road to 27. Um, if you, from here, Buckingham Place, I think it is, ultimately connects to Westside Boulevard, and you can take Westside Boulevard all the way up to 192. That's, that's the goal. That's a priority. We have made a commitment on a $15 million allocation, and the state, uh, we think we're about to nail down some agreements with the Department of Transportation and that they will fund the balance of that project and deliver that project for county ownership. I'm guessing that project's probably somewhere in the 50 to $60 million range. Uh, on the other side, uh, on the west side of uh, 27, uh, this uh, is, the north, this is the, the, an unfunded section of the Northridge Trail. Northridge Trail starts here at Dean Steel and goes up to Sand Mine. There is a need to improve that segment, that leg of Dean Steel, and this leg of Waverly Barn so that we can, can connect this backage on Northridge Trail. That is becoming a priority project. The, the last thing I'll, I'll mention to you is, I said about roundabouts. Look, the, the last thing I've read about roundabouts is in Florida, probably 45% of the serious injuries and fatalities occur at intersections that are controlled by stop signs or signalization. The data strongly supports that now upwards of 80 percent, you can, you can, 80 percent uh, safety improvement once you install these roundabouts at those traditionally uh, uh, controlled intersections by way of stop signs or signalizations. This is the, I think this is the first one that we, we built. This is, this is the one up there off of uh, Galloway Road and Sleepy Hill. We just finished another one out off of Old Lake Wales and County Road 653. Um, that we, we believe in them. I think they're, I think this is aesthetically pleasing, but it more so it's a safety initiative. They're here to stay. Um, get used to them because you're going to see more of them, at least on the county network. Last thing I'll leave you with, well, one of the last things, 
one of our, the speakers talked about trails. The county is committed to the trail system from a recreational and, and a mobility uh, perspective. Uh, this is a major trail initiative off of our um, Fort Fraser Trail there in, it connects Bartow into Lake Wales, excuse me, La Lakeland. Uh, it, that trail currently ends right here at Winter Lake Road. This project will take it across Winter Lake Road, connect it parallel to the Polk Parkway on the west side of uh, Lakeland Highlands Road and connect it into the trail system of the city of Lakeland's trail system on Glendale Street. Uh, this is about a $4 million project. The state has agreed to fund about $3.8 million of this project. Uh, the design is finished. Uh, the state money should be available in July. I'd like to think we'll start construction this fall. One of the things, the last thing I will leave you with is, is that I, these are the projects that I just mentioned. So those that are fully funded, those that are queuing up for funding, this is about $450 million in local county roadways, a half a billion dollars in local county roadway. And what's not here is probably another 20 projects that are unfunded at this time. Probably over a billion dollars of county projects that are unfunded on local roadways. But what, what is in, important for this slide is I want you to see what we call, what I call the urban belt. Look at where all these projects are located. You're not seeing a lot of projects in the Green Swamp area north of I-4 in this corridor. You're not seeing a lot of projects south of 60. That's the urban belt. That's where all the demand is. That's where all the traffic congestion is. That's where all the, um, the mobility needs are. This is just about 10 of our heavy lift capacity projects. I've got dozens of other intersection improvements, turn lanes, signalizations, a lot of other projects, some of which are funded, most of which are not funded. Over a billion dollars in local needs that are not funded to this day. Uh, I'm going to play this quick video. This is uh, West Pipkin Road. This is just off of the end of the runway area there where Sun and Fun is conducted. That's uh, about, about one minute. Thank you, folks. Enjoyed being here. If there's any questions, I think Parag will have a few questions for the panel, but uh, I'll stick around for a little while in case you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm very excited to be here today. And uh, I just want to, I see Kimberly here from the media, so I just want to make sure that we clarify that I know transit edged out in the poll, uh, the expansion of the roadways network. I had a uh, 13-year-old hostage son who had to vote for transit, and I believe I have the most employees here. So I think roadways actually went out slightly. Just want to make sure that makes the, the newspaper properly. But I'm very excited to be here today at this state-of-the-art facility, and I realize that we have buses that are going to be boarding in just about 20 minutes, so I will be as brief as possible. But Parag had talked about being here at SunTrax and it really being what transportation is going to be in the vision for the entire state and the entire country in the next 30 to 50 years. And I just couldn't help but sit here and be transported back to 1916 when Imperial Polk County got its name and made the decision that at the time it was going to invest the whopping sum of $1.5 million to build 217 miles of roadway. And Imperial Polk County refers to all roads lead to Rome. So investing in transportation infrastructure and leading the way is truly in our DNA in Polk County. We are the fastest growing state in the union, we are the fastest growing county in the state, and we are the belt buckle between Tampa and Orlando, and we are geographically in the center of the state. Everything is happening in Polk County. So um, John and Bill talked a lot about multi-million dollar projects that they have. This presentation is about public transportation. 
uh, and could alternatively be called the treading water presentation. We don't have a lot of big projects, but I want to talk about where we've been and where we're going. The Citrus Connection in Public Transportation was established in 1982. We started off with eight bus routes, and the Citrus Connection uh, delivered 200,000 trips that first year. Moving forward, uh, the Citrus Connection today provides 2.2 million trips. Our vehicles travel a whopping 7,500 miles a day. Uh, so again, as Parag had talked about, we are covering in transit the size of Delaware uh, or Rhode Island. The current base fare of the Citrus Connection is $1.50, and the average rider on the Citrus Connection takes between two and five trips per day. 87% of the people who use public transportation in Polk County do not have access to a personal use vehicle. So if it were not for the Citrus Connection, they would not be able to get uh, to work, to medical appointments, to where they need to be. So for all of our successes in Polk County, it should be recognized that in the 2010 census, and the 2020 census data is coming out now, Polk County in the Lakeland Urban, Winter Haven urbanized area was the seventh poorest suburban area in the United States. 17.7% of our population being at or below the federal poverty line. The federal poverty line for a family of three today is $21,500. And we know we have an affordable housing crisis. And according to AAA, the average cost of owning a vehicle in the United States is $6,600 a year. The average new car payment in the United States this year hit an all-time high of $716 a month. So as you can see, owning a car can be very challenging for the beginning of that workforce. I see Sean Malott is here from the uh, CFDC, the Winter Haven EDC, our partners. They are working diligently on bringing those high-wage, high-skilled jobs to Polk County pulling the right side of that bell curve as hard as they can. The Citrus Connection is working as much as possible with our entry-level workforce to push the back of that bell curve forward so that we're providing economic opportunities as well. Alan Baruby from the Brookings Institute, when he was asked why Polk County, the Lakeland Ur Winter Haven urbanized area, was the seventh poorest suburban area in the United States, he said it was a lack of mass transportation. So we're combating that as much as we can. Move forward to today, we had a system merger. Many of you may know we had a unsuccessful transportation referendum in 2014, but we had a plan B, and we went to the Polk County Board of County Commissioners, and we said we have the Lakeland Area Mass Transit District, and the Polk County Board of County Commissioners is operating Winter Haven Area Transit on the east side of the county and rural transit services. And so we gave them a choice. They can, of course, do the status quo, they could subcontract it out to a for-profit carrier who may or may not have been able to do it for cheaper, but that their 88 employees would definitely lose their pensions, or they could effectively contract for a fee for service with the Citrus Connection, and we would guarantee that their employees would retain their pensions, and we would do it for the same amount of money or less. So I'm very excited to say, and thank you to the current county commission and the former county commissioners that they chose to merge with the Citrus Connection, and today, we have an organization of over 200 employees, and uh, we have an $18 million budget. I'd also like to thank all of our municipal partners. As we merged the transit organizations, you all had the opportunity to become investors in the transit system. So our municipalities now that have transit service, many of you are here today, have entered into fair share agreements, and we certainly appreciate that. Where the communities are paying 20% of their local dollars to be able to cover the cost of transit. So I think whether the county commissioners were here today or not, I would just like to recognize them that Polk County, this co county commission, is the most public transit friendly county commission in the state of Florida in so much as that they fund not only county services, but they help fund the, the municipal services on the east side of the county. So we're very excited about that. Where are we going in the future? How are we continuing to gain market share? I'm very excited about our universal access partnerships. You may have read about these in the ledger. The ledger loves to call them ride-free programs because that sells papers, but nothing could be further from the truth. These are fair subsidy programs. The first one started with Polk State College in 2014 with the Holden administration and continues with the Falconelli administration. 
the 2,400 students, faculty, and staff of Polk State College can ride the bus for free because they pay for the fares out of the student bookstore. We went from 2,400 rides a month to 15,000 rides a month, a month amongst Polk State College students. And it wasn't that they didn't have the $3 to be able to ride the bus. What it shows is, is that when we remove the barriers to access to using public transportation, that people will try it. And once they try it, they recognize that it's easy and they can save money and it becomes a habit. And so that ridership increases. We've continued to expand our universal access program. We are one of only two transit systems in the United States that has a federally approved contract. The 25,000 high school students of the Polk County Public Schools can ride the bus system for free and they pay less than the fee for one bus driver in order to do that. Not only are students able to get to and from school, they're able to get to tutoring, they're able to get to jobs, and thanks to the current administration, they're also covered over the summer. Uh, and then we have additional universal access partnerships in Peace River Center, New Beginnings High School, Pace Center for Girls, Central Florida Healthcare, Southeastern University, and I will talk about Legoland in a moment. So if we look at how we are changing perceptions of public transportation in Polk County, if we look at the universal access program, we could see, theoretically, the life of a child in Polk County. They start off in high school and they are exposed to the Colts program, so they maybe ride the bus or they know someone at Lakeland High School or Winter Haven High School who rode the bus or CFAA who rode the bus. They go to Polk State College, they see uh, students riding the bus or they choose to ride the bus and then imagine a day where they get a job in Legoland in management and they continue to ride the bus. So in order to change the perception of public transportation to what many of you see in large cities and in Europe, we recognize we need to start with our youngest residents and expose them to public transportation. They may not ride it, but if their colleagues are riding it, if they're hearing those stories, that impacts the way that they feel about public transportation moving forward. I'm not gonna ask how many of you rode the bus because I don't wanna see your ha no hands go up, but I will say that we recognize and our board recognizes that not everyone uses the bus. So we have focused, thanks to our partners at FDOT, uh, we have partnered on opening up additional park and ride facilities. Our newest park and ride facilities are at Posner Park, which I'll talk about more in a moment on the east side of the county and the Gow Fields Park and Ride lot, which was just talked about at I-4 and 98. And having these park and ride lots has allowed us to enter into public-private partnerships with the, with the private sector in order to provide rubber-wheeled transit access to our east and to our west and even out of the state. I'm happy to announce that we just launched last month, as reported by Lakeland Now, a partnership with Flixbus, their European outfit, and you can now catch uh, public transportation to Orlando and Tampa from the Gow Fields Park and Ride lot on an air-conditioned bus with Wi-Fi and charging stations. We also have partnerships in Lakeland and Winter Haven with Greyhound, and for a short time we had Megabus. They have not fully recuperated yet from uh, the pandemic, but we hope that they return to the I-4 corridor soon. And then we have connections with SunRail uh, on the east side of the county. And regardless of where a possible Polk County terminal comes for Brightline, uh, public transportation, rubber wheeled service will focus on how we get the suburban communities of Polk County to wherever that Brightline station is. Uh, our future, we continue to work with public private partners on our future. So uh, this is a picture of myself and the Winter Haven city manager. And we partnered with the city of Winter Haven um, uh, commission, I see Stephen Honeycutt here, I believe he was on the commission at the time. And Merlin Entertainment, the parent company of Legoland, went to the city of Winter Haven and came to the Citrus Connection and said, as we've opened up the hotel, the housekeeping staff is not able to turn over the rooms by 3 p.m. check-in because there's no public transportation on Sunday. What can we do about that? So we partnered with the city of Winter Haven and with, Le and with Legoland, and for a number of years now, Winter Haven has enjoyed seven day a week transit service because of a public private public public partnership with Legoland. So not only are Legoland model citizens or their employees able to get to work, 
They use it as a recruitment and retention tool. Come work here, you get to work outside, we've got dental, we've got medical, we've got vision, but you can also use your employee badge to ride the bus, not just to and from work, but on the weekends. Uh, but anyone who lives within the Cypress Gardens corridor is able to utilize that seven day a week transit service. And I see some of our partners here uh, that work with visually impaired individuals. This also includes the ADA paratransit. So those elderly or disabled individuals that need door-to-door -door service or curb-to-curb -curb service in the corridor, they're able to have access to transportation as well. We also have partnerships, and I see Chuck Barnby here. Chuck, thank you very much, on how we work with impact fees for both operating and uh, capital. This is an example of the Ramco Center. You can see that it's just off of I-4. And thanks to working with Chuck and the city of Lakeland, rather than uh, the intersections that were here, Chuck looked at it, they were working well, the sidewalks were working well. And so we worked with them to fund purchasing a bus and a bus route that benefited all of North Lakeland, but also brought shoppers and employees to them. And we've also been able to do that thanks to Bill Beasley and Jim Freeman and the county commission. We were able to do that on the east side of the county with what is largely the East County Transfer Facility, which is at Posner Park. And so the east side of the county now has a transfer site at Posner Park where the majority of the vehicles come in. And the future also includes microtransit. And I heard we were talking, Frank, I think you were talking about everybody loves golf carts. And so we realize that a one-size-fits-all approach is not necessary. Some people are going to ride the big bus. Some people are going to use paratransit. But what were we going to do for our downtown communities? And so thanks to the board, of, uh, the board of Directors at the Citrus Connection, we launched two years ago the Squeeze. It is the first public transit golf cart system in the state of Florida. It is a hop-on, hop-off service that focuses largely on downtown Lakeland and downtown Lakeland special events. It is on a published schedule. It is open to the public. We have ADA accessible vehicles for any individuals who need accessibility. And we are doing between two and 400 rides um, uh, evening, Friday and Saturday nights, and to the farmer's market on our golf carts. Uh, as I said, 87% of the people who use the Citrus Connection are transit dependent. For this product, almost 100% of the individuals who use this have access to a personal use vehicle. So we're relevant not only to the transit dependent, but we're spending approximately 1% of our budget to expose in a completely different segment of the population to public transit. So I thank you all very much and I'll stand for any questions and I hope we gained a little time back. Hello. Here you are. Hello. Uh, so again, a great presentation. We just heard that all the agencies are basically working together to, make, to mitigate the challenges of traffic congestion on poor county roadways. So I have basically one question each from each of these three speakers. I know we are basically running late by around five, 10 minutes, but we are not uh, losing any audience. So maybe we can push the schedule by five, 10 more minutes. So I have basically designed one question each for each speaker, and then we can basically open the floor to the audience so that if you have any questions from us. So since Tom came, Tom went last, let me start with Tom. Uh, Tom, what I have seen, that there's a general understanding now that we cannot solve the problems of traffic congestion by only building new roads or widening existing roads. Transit is a very important piece of the solution. Uh, Poke TPO worked with Citrus Connections on developing a transit master plan. We are working with Florida Department of Transportation on a TCAR study to see how can we extend Sun Rail into Polk County. But as you know, Polk County and Santa Florida is still very car dependent. And as you also said, that transit is still a mode of need than the mode of choice. So based on your experience, how do you see the role of transit will evolve in Polk County in the next 20 to 30 years? Excellent, so I, I think that this is a, a great question and we definitely need to change the perception of public transportation in, in the state. 
um, and in, specifically in Polk County. So I think that there's a couple of examples of things that we've been able to do. Some of it is looking at forced innovation. So in order to get the people in this room out of your car, you want transit to be three things, fast, frequent, and fun. And so providing 15-minute frequency, which is what most of you would expect in order to get out of your personal use vehicle, that requires a massive investment. So we have to get creative on how we're going to do that. One of the ways that we are able to do that, Prague, is looking at uh, the Dixieland Road diet in, in the, in the uh, Lakeland area. We knew that that road was a state road that was not meeting requirements. It was too uh, narrow. And so they had a road diet solution. We were actually able to reduce uh, fixed route transit in the area. We deleted 14 bus stops, which you think would be catastrophic, but it actually was able to, we were able to show the residents that we were able to move express through that area, get them through a little bit quicker from a transit perspective. And then thanks to our partners at FDOT, we created a community circulator that was called the Dixieland Road Shuttle, and it effectively mirrored the 14 stops that we deleted in a very tight loop. And there were some senior high rises that are there, and so what we were able to do was actually increase transit usage in a corridor by deleting fixed route stops, getting the people who are in their cars excited that the buses are not stopping, but increasing transit and people were able to go to the grocery store, they were able to go to their medical appointments, they were able to transfer at the terminal, and so we were really able to change the, per the, per the perceptions of that. Um, the increased unpredictability of I-4 is what's really driving people to look at transportation. 27 is almost worse than I-4. Uh, I-4 used to be predictably bad, now it's unpredictably bad. And so I think the fact that people are really getting sick of traffic, they're starting to look at public transportation options. I really like the way what you said in your presentation that Citrus Connections is spending 1% of its budget on a squeeze, but we are getting a total new clientele. Correct. Yeah, we're very, we're very excited about that. Uh, you see the college students excited about it. You see the Historic Neighborhood Association riding it. You see individuals who are driving downtown, but now rather than uh, moving their car three or four times, we're just getting them into a park once philosophy. Uh, so that's very exciting. And to see the ownership of the business community, they're marketing their products based on the squeeze. We were able to partner with the Lakeland Police Chief, mm -hmm. and thanks to, the, uh, to our board, they actually funded running on New Year's Eve until 2 a.m. And so we had a, a public safety campaign that was called Leave the Keys and Ride the Squeeze. We didn't want to have something that turned into a drunk bus, but we realized on New Year's Eve that people are going to consume alcohol and it's better for them to leave their keys at home. We did 66 rides from midnight to 2 a.m. Those were 66 local rides. We didn't count the people we took back to the hotel. So those were people that we firmly believe would have chosen to have gotten in their cars and gone downtown that chose to use public transportation to get home safely and then scores of tourists that went back to the RP funding center at, rather than driving their cars on our streets. So there's a public safety component that's there as well. What's happening in Lake Wales right now with their downtown redevelopment and their downtown visioning, the squeeze is part of that conversation. So it can work in a variety of areas. Imagine Bartow, an evening squeeze probably doesn't work. But when you realize that Bartow doubles during the day, all those people who come out of the county buildings, all those people that come out of the courthouse, would they use a lunch squeeze so they could get downtown, eat lunch, and get back within half an hour or 45 minutes? I think they would. So it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Yeah, again, as you are saying, there's no one solution for all the community needs. My second question is for Mr. Bill Beasley. Uh, Bill, again, as you mentioned in your presentation that Polk County is investing sig significantly in transportation. And transportation is one of the top priorities of Polk County BOCC. But as you saw in our presentations, the traffic is, is, is still increasing because of the significant population growth. From the local government perspective, and as the county manager of one of the fastest growing counties in the country, how can we narrow the gap between the infrastructure that's needed and the infrastructure that the communities can afford? So there's always a gap between what you can afford and what's needed. Um, let me, a couple of things, Paraga. I don't, look, I don't know that the county government in and of itself is going to solve this problem. 
I, I really, I, um, I don't think that's, I, I can't do it all. I think, I think there are several things a county has considered, does consider, and will have to continue to consider. Um, one of those, I think, is public-private partnerships. I think what you'll see is the county will probably entertain more uh, developer-type agreements. I believe the developers have a vested interest. I think it's a mutually beneficial solution. I think developers have a, an ability to deliver projects quicker than government standards can deliver them. I think they can um, deliver those projects at a lower cost than government traditionally can do that. And, and there's mutual benefit. There is right-of-way acquisition. There are pond sites. There's, there's a quid pro quo in terms of what they do, in terms of uh, what we get, at what local government can get out of that. But I think you'll see more public-private partnerships. And the other thing I, th I think you'll see is, is that the county has done a pretty good job of leveraging local money uh, to draw down state and federal money. Now, look, the county, Polk County has never asked the state or the feds, and will never ask the state or the feds, to do our job. The county will do the heavy lift. The county will fund 80 to 90 percent of every local roadway project. It's our responsibility. But we do ask the state to assist us with that, especially, and the feds, especially where we think there's mutual benefit, where we can um, do something that will help alleviate congestion or mobility challenges on the state network or part of the federal network. So I, I think you'll see uh, the county work harder and be more aggressive in leveraging local money to draw down state and federal monies. Um, and probably the last thing I'll say is, is that, uh, um, and it's because road projects are awfully complicated. They, they take a long time to execute uh, and they're very expensive. Um, I, I think you're gonna find that uh, the, the county is gonna have to look at how it funds these sources of, of, of revenues. What the county has different tools in our bag to fund these things, but they're limited in terms of their, how we can sustain them and, and the amounts of funds that they generate. So is the county looking at a host of things that includes impact fee adjustments? Uh, are they looking at millage adjustments? Uh, do they look at surtax issues? Uh, special referendum discussions, all of that is things that I think the county is and will have to continue to discuss in the future. But doing the business the way we do it today, we get some things done. It takes a long time because their projects take a long time and, and I don't have the funding to sure. do a lot of those projects simultaneously. So I think multiple strategies, Barack. No, thank you. As you're saying, public-private partnerships, right? Again, no one government, no county government, no city government, or no state government has resources to deal with all the issues. So it's basically partnerships. How can we all work together to serve our residents? Right. Uh, my final question is for John. Again, thank you for investing so much in Polk County. Uh, but as you just mentioned, District 1 is huge. We have 12 counties in District 1. Out of this 12 counties, five counties are inland counties, uh, seven counties are inland counties, and five counties are coastal counties. We have urban, we have urban suburban, and rural counties in District 1. You are in Polk County today. We are telling you about our need. If you go to Sarasota Manatee area, they will tell you about their needs. Uh, with such a large district and with so many competing interests, how does Florida Department of Transportation prioritizes the state resources? <laughs> Again, there are so many competing interests, right? Everyone is saying we need X, Y, and Z, but there's always limited funding sources. Yes, thank you, Prague. Lots and lots of competing interests in every MPO, TPO I visit. I'm their best friend, and they all tell me about all their priorities, but it's a good thing. Um, actually, the question for the next decade or so is probably simpler in the case of for District 1, because as I was sharing with you all earlier, we have an extremely high resurfacing program as far as the number of lane miles and the cost of that program. We don't peak until fiscal year 26, and as I was sharing, that's like more than double what our historical lane mile targets typically are at 524 lane miles in that one single year. So obviously that takes a lot of money off the top of our program statewide. 
and safety and preservation are the number one priorities of the DOT. We have to maintain the infrastructure we have in place. You know, the 3R program is based on pavement condition, which is, which is basically three elements we look at, the crack, ride, and the rut. But all the cost of that program for construction is taken off the top before any other funds go into the lower buckets, like for the CIS program or district allocated funds for you know, non-CIS highways and things of that nature and multiple other programs. So when that comes off the top, we've also noticed in the last couple of years significant price increases for these, for these types of projects, whether it's widening or resurfacing. You know, the labor shortages, the material price increases, it's even that much more off the top. So my point for all this is that leaves a lot less going into the lower buckets, particularly for the district allocated funds. So when we do get our district allocated funds, guess where a lot of that goes? Those three R projects because off the top pays for construction, the district allocated funds have to pay for the design and the CEI of all that three R. So it doesn't leave you an awful lot left in the lower buckets to fund, you know, non-cis widening, intersection improvements, and other needed projects. So I share all that in the sense that I often fondly refer to District 1 as the Department of Milling and Resurfacing with a sprinkle of safety thrown in, because that's what we do. That's our number one priority. Safety is key. But we also, you know, we, we do have money left in other buckets and we do look at um, where we might best apply that. And as Parag shared, you know, we work very closely with the MPOs and TPOs in our district. And we've also begun to share with them a tool that we've developed that we call the year of need. And the year of need is basically a long range traffic forecast based on the adopted model and it applies um, land use and, and a lot of projections that can tell us when these roadways are expected to reach a level of service F where congestion is pretty much brought it into near gridlock conditions. So we call that the year of need. It's when we would say that this segment of roadway is in desperate need of capacity, capacity improvements. And we've modeled that out for the entire state highway system within our district and we have a projected year for each of those segments. So obviously, a lot of the corridors, as you're familiar with, we would call a constrained corridor where the road's as wide as it's gonna get. You've got a lot of buildings and hotels right up to our right-of-way line, so that's, you know, that's a constrained corridor. It's not financially feasible to buy right-of-way to widen those roads, but that doesn't mean we can't do other improvements such as TS, M and O, other types of, you know, you look where the bottlenecks are, what can we do, is it, you know, can we add a turn lane? Or sometimes the turn lane's not long enough and it's just simply traffic spilling out into the through lane and you're stuck and everybody's trying to merge. So sometimes those solutions can be easier and still add value for a lot less cost of a widening project. And as we talked about before, you know, safety has to outweigh our capacity needs. We have to put safety first. That's what we're all about is safety. And we put a lot of focus on a lot of the two-way rural roadways in our district, simply because there's a lot of high speed and run off the road crashes on those two lane rural highways. So we try to target where those are occurring and we look for solutions to address those needs. And for a lot of folks that live here in Polk County, you know how it is if you get a two lane road that's shut down because we have a really severe crash, detours can be horrific. They can be 10, 15, 20 miles sending somebody around because of a crash that closed the roadway. And that's a big issue, you know, for emergency services, police, fire, you know, when a road is closed down for sometimes hours at a time. And last and certainly not least, it's the ongoing partnerships we have with the Polk TPO and the other MPOs around our district. We work very closely with them as they develop their, wrong, their long range <clears throat> transportation plan, which basically helps us prioritize what the needs are for the roadways around our, our district and particularly in this case within the region of the Polk TPO. So they give us this list of priority projects and we work very closely with them to try to make sure we can at least fund those down as far as our resources go in the order that's been prioritized to the extent that we're able. And we build a program called the five year work program based on that critical input from the Polk TPO. 
So these projects, basically we're funding every stage of development from planning PD&E, design, right of way, construction, CEI. Those are all phases that we need to work closely to build out that program. And together, I think we build a really powerful program that addresses the most critical needs here in Polk County. Um, thank you, John. You do, you do have a very tough job when these hundreds of communities and millions of people are looking towards you or maybe blaming you. <laughs> uh, but again, we jokes apart, we really value the partnership which we have with Florida Department of Transportation. Yes, sir. So with this, uh, uh, I will open the f uh, for any questions which we have from the audience. We have a mic floating around. And the first question is from uh, Chair Lindsay. Is that working? There we go. Yes. You justifiably and appropriately mentioned the importance of, of maintenance of the existing facilities, certainly. And for the local jurisdictions, the source of the revenue for that is the gas tax, uh, mostly dedicated for that purpose, at least in our jurisdiction. With the gas tax now being flatlined due to increased fuel efficiency and others, how do EVs propose to pay their proportionate share? Well, that's actually a very good question, and it's drawn a lot of attention lately, and rightfully so. You know, we've uh, done our projections, and you know, most everything's funded from the gasoline trust fund and right around fiscal year 26, 27 ish. That's kind of when our program begins to plateau out and actually begin to decline because of the increased efficiency of the fossil fuel burning vehicles and certainly the increased um, infusion of the electric vehicles onto the highway system. So there's a lot of different proposals that are being talked about, and I think some of the most popular ones that are gaining traction are ones where there might be an annual fee for the electric vehicles, maybe $200 a year or something, where they're still paying a proportionate share that would go towards the, you know, the preservation and maintenance of the roadway system. You know, I've heard of other ones in the past that people talked about whether you put some sort of a, you know, a mechanism in your car and you pay by the number of miles you drive, but those just never seem to get a lot of traction because it felt too much like Big Brother getting into your business and tracking your mileage and how much you use. But I do think something that could go forward would be, you know, some sort of a flat fee per year, you know, based on whether it's a tag, registration, renewal, or whatever, that'll bring in a couple hundred dollars per year per electric vehicle. That seems to be where they're trending at this point. Thank you. Anyone else? Hey, I'm not sure which one of you will answer this question? You say it, we can decide. Okay. Um, so we heard a lot of talk about cars, but very little talk about light rail. When might we invest in that for our community, for our residents? Um, maybe light rail all over the county. Um, and I'll just throw in that in Polk Vision's mental health study, if you lived in Frostproof, and you have an appointment with a counselor in Lakeland because there are no counselors in Frostproof, it is an all-day adventure to take public transportation to get to Lakeland. So. Uh, so I can start, and then I will give it to Tom so that you can jump in. So as you said, uh, yes, we are focused on roads, but uh, as, again, uh, transit is a very important piece of the solution to mitigate the traffic problems. So Polk TPO recently worked on a transit master plan, and in the trans transit master plan, we are looking for uh, major investments on, uh, for BRT, that's bus rapid transit, along Route 98. We are talking about I-4 Hopper, which is basically a BRT on I-4. We are also working with Florida Department of Transportation, I see Charlene in the audience, on us extending Sunrail into Polk County. Again, uh, we are also working with Brightline, the partnership with Brightline to see when the Brightline gets extended from uh, Orlando to Tampa, how can we have a stop of Brightline somewhere in Polk County? So I totally agree with you that uh, yes, we, are, we should continue to focus on roads, expansion, new roads, but again, roads is not only the part, it's not the only solution for our traffic congestion. Tom, do you want to add something? I mean, you just hit, yeah, you hit the nail on the head, but I will just say that, so, Kimberly, I think your question's good. I'm obviously a rubber-wheeled service person. 
Um, and I like it because the nice thing about rubber wheeled service is as the social and economic indicators change, large employers change, you can change the route. Once you lay the, the rail down, it's, it's there for good or for bad. Um, obviously developers love it because it's great for transit oriented development. So I would echo what Parag said. I think that you start with bus rapid transit. You start with a rubber wheeled service. If this is where you think you want to have light rail in the future, start with bus rapid transit. And we're working uh, on, as you said, on 98 to be able to do something with bus rapid transit so we can prove the case. We look in Pinellas, they currently have the Sun Runner, which is bus rapid transit. Looking at our rail options that are coming or are in Polk, uh, you've got Brightline, which is the private sector, um, and that is going, that is fun. The, the Orlando station is absolutely incredible. It's going to be going from Orlando to Tampa. My professional opinion is Polk County will not get a stop as it starts. I think we'll get one after the service starts. I hope we get one, but I, I, I think the model is more that we'll get it afterwards. Uh, but wherever that stop is, it's going to fundamentally change the way that Polk County uses the rubber wheel transit system. Because I came from Chicago and from Pace uh, 11 years ago. And if you look at the seven collar counties around Chicago, Pace Suburban Bus focuses on park and ride lots and getting people to Metra so that they can get into the city of Chicago from whatever suburb they choose to live in. So I see when Brightline opens up and Polk gets a stop, there are going to be park and ride lots all over our county where people want to go to their from their local neighborhood to a park and ride lot in their community, and then they want the Citrus Connection to take them there express so that they can get on the bright line and get wherever they want within the state of Florida. Sunrail uh, kisses Polk County, if you will, right on the border. Uh, we have Citrus Connection Transit Service that links up with the service. Uh, our, our service times sync up. Ridership right now is good, um, but could be better. And there is discussion about bringing that further into Polk County. The major challenge with that, and I think the discussion that has to occur is uh, how does that funding work and what is the lift associated with bringing that into Polk County? So currently the three counties that have uh, the service have not figured out how they're going to fund that long term and DOT is largely playing, paying for the capital and the operating. So I think once those counties figure out what the true cost is and they figure out how they're going to fund that, uh, through their local dollars, that's a great time to then see what is the actual cost of bringing it into Polk County. So we've got a variety of options, which is great, because again, we're the most important part of the belt. We're the buckle. Uh, you can't wear it without us, so um, we're, we're strategically located. Just want to add what uh, Tom just mentioned. The way I see it, transportation and transit is not only about moving people around. It's also a tool for economic development. It's about job creation. It's about job retention. So we do work very closely with the economic development professionals to look at various options which are there for our, for our residents. Uh, do you want to add, uh, John, Bill, do you want to add something? <laughs> okay, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I thought someone will ask about I-4, when are we fixing I-4, but anyway. <laughs> Again, thank you for all, all of you joining us. Again, we had a great attendance. Uh, we had a great host in SunTrax. And I, as I said, the most interesting part of this forum is touring this facility. Uh, the two buses have been provided to us by Citrus Connections. And uh, these, these buses can hold around 35 to 40 folks, so around 70 to 80 folks can go on the SunTrax tour. But again, I just want to thank you for joining us and working with us. And very soon, you will see a big difference in traffic issues in Polk County. Thank you. <laughs>